Okay, we have the honor of uh, Chris Langman. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the highest IQs in the world, higher than Einstein. I cannot imagine how your brain thinks every day, especially about other people around you. <laughs> and you're the author of uh, Cognitive Theoretic Model of the Universe. We just had uh, Donald Hoffman in, and boy, he, he blew my mind. Yeah, Hoffman's uh, actually a pretty smart guy. He's got this uh, gooey, or I think he calls it mooey theory. Uh, and uh, he's got a gooey. You know what a gooey is? It's a graphic yeah. user interface. So, but he doesn't have any place to stick the graphic user interface. Okay. Mm -hmm. It takes a computer system. Okay. So you've got to model reality as a simulation in order to do that. You've got to model reality in some way analogous to a uh, the matrix, for example. Okay. And uh, Donald doesn't have that. He's, uh, you know, he's been working on it for a while. Like I say, he's a smart guy. He's got some collaborators, but uh, he's got like the same old approach to it that a lot of other people have. There are a couple of theories of con consciousness out now that, that are a little bit slanted toward computation theory and, and that kind of thing. But this is a little bit above that. Now, there was another interview that I did a while ago in which I actually, I think... Donald Hoffman has been interviewed by by that interviewer as as well recently, and uh, I just don't think he's catching on. I'm like I'm not exactly one of the club in academia. You see what I mean? Yeah. So Hoffman probably has no idea of what I'm doing. Right? He's not going to hear about me through academia. That's a grapevine. You see, and I'm not in that grapevine. That's if you want to talk about a closed club that locks the door against any outsider. Academia is it. I mean, yeah. it's the worst thing to go oh, in, in that respect. So Donald is that. Donald's kind of yeah. stuck in the middle of that. So that's where he's at on that. So although, uh, you know, I would certainly um, hope that someday he will find out what kind of system it is he needs to stick his gooey into. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I don't know if that's going to happen. Now, with what you do, and when I was reading through it, you can ask him. I, I was all excited because this is my thing. I, I've gone down this rabbit hole for the last uh, six months, hoping that there's actual UFOs and everything else. So when we talk about reality, I know, I I know, I know. <laughs> well, the government blew it. They they blew it with too much of this now. I, I had hope. but They've all, blown it in every conceivable way. Yeah, they, every bit of hope I had is now gone. Um, but what's your theory with that what's your theory on reality and then do you think hoffman's right as far as this is an interface of some sort well yes there's an you know hoffman's 100 percent correct we have perceptions in some ways those perceptions don't align with the logic that we think has to be there in order for those perceptions to arise Right. No, he shall show you optical illusions. You can see optical illusions where the brain is actually adding data into whatever the input is and and being misled in certain respects. Hoffman's point is that it's got to be adaptive. OK, the reason that something like that survives is you get this kind of mutated perception is that it has adaptive value. So it adds to the fitness of the organism with that. What he's saying is, is that it's like everybody's born with meta glasses on. And then when you take them off, who knows what's outside of there, that there is no space and time, that conscience creates space and time. And then in all... Consciousness, yeah. Yeah, and you you do agree with that? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. But but uh, I can actually go into the nuts and bolts of it, whereas he can't. Go into yeah. the nuts and bolts of it if you can. Well, he's talking about space-time. Space-time has a certain definition. Basically, what it is is a sequence of states. We can't discern anything in space-time without actually identifying states. This means that the way we interface with space-time, it's nothing but a series of snapshots. It's like the old video reels, the video cameras. Yeah. You had strips of film with frames on them, okay? So it's one frame after another after another, and we get the illusion of motion. When you try to build a manifold, uh, a, a medium of reality, and that's what space-time is supposed to be, you find that you have problems with continuity. So it's got to be this kind of frame after frame after frame. Now, when you have frame after frame after frame, you're not seeing the transitions between the frames. Mm. Okay? Those are your right. intervals. Those are your state transformations. It takes a whole extension of the space-time manifold in order to accommodate those intervals or those transformations. Okay? And this is the kind of thing that most people who deal with space-time have no idea. They don't know what a medium is. They don't know how it works, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, is that because they're too just ingrained in whatever philosophy they had studied or book they studied for 30 years, even though they know, say, Chris's theory is 100% accurate, I'm not going to go against the grain because I've put 30 years into this. Uh, yeah, it's something like that. Basically, you know, academia used to be about education. Now it's about education, indoctrination, and social engineering. Right? <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of indoctrination that goes in. Now, when you're a guy, you know, if you're in a, a mathematics or physics curriculum or something like that, it's hard. You know, you got to work your butt off. You got to solve a lot of problems. They're giving you a lot of work to do. And these guys get in there. And meanwhile, as they do these problems and are, and are, and are made into slaves by their thesis advisors <laughs> and so forth, right? They, they kind of fall into that indoctrination. And it's a mental model. They build mental models. The mental models that they are using to solve their problems are the ones that they use. They become ingrained. And pretty soon these guys can't escape. They can't imagine what else there could possibly be besides what they're dealing with. In the case of the space-time manifold and, and even the classical manifold of classical physics, they're dealing with uh, a, a classical manifold, which is the real manifold, right? Usually it's an R with an exponent N up top. N is the dimensionality of the manifold, right? right? You know, it's just a coordinate space. It's a Cartesian coordinate space, right? You got three coordinates, X, Y, Z. And then if you want to turn it into space-time, then you add a fourth coordinate, which is time. OK, this is the way they build that. That doesn't work for modeling, for really modeling the dynamics of a space. Right. Because now, we, a we made time, right? Because the, we the, the, made this, time. So how would that work? We made time. Well, it, it, it works because to a certain extent, time, time has to align with physical dimensions of space. Otherwise, we can't see anything move. We can't see anything change. Yeah. So because it, time aligns with the physical dimensions of space, it can, to a certain extent, be treated as a spatial dimension, oh. which is what physicists are doing when they add a fourth dimension to the manifold, right? And then, well, that way, they get a four-dimensional manifold, pseudo-Riemannian manifold, and that is space-time as a physicist deals with. Wow. Right. OK. But the problem is, once again, that is our end. That is a, a manifold that doesn't work. The manifold shuts itself down because its points are cuts. They're not actual points, actual things that exist in the manifold. They're discontinuities. They're actual cuts in the manifold. And when you add all those cuts together, guess what you get? Nothing. Who we'll say? <laughs> yeah. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. You add a bunch of zeros up, no matter how many times you add zero to itself, all you get is zero. Right. 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 So they, right. these guys and these guys, I mean, Lord knows. And most of them, of course, are highly trained in calculus. You want to get through, uh, you know, math in 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 college, uh, especially in a, in a curriculum like physics. You need at least two years of hardcore calculus in order to do that. And these calculus instructors have been telling people for years, well, we can use the cauchy weierstrass method, uh, you know, and, and just uh, have these limit points. And then we have infinite series, infinite converging series that approach the limit points. And we use this uh, this epsilon delta relationship to prove that if you get close enough to one of these limit points, then there's always a value of your function that is within that. that. But you never get to the limit. Right. These never. guys never actually reach the limit. That's why it's called a limit. You know, it's a cut. It's actually an actual hole in the manifold, so they can't get there. Right. <laughs> And they've wow. forgotten about this. And they say, well, nevertheless, we have dynamics and things are moving from one point to another. It's exactly what you cannot do in a real manifold. Wow. So so you have to, if you want to really understand what's going on, then you've got to change that to something else. And that's what the CTMU contains, something called a conspansive manifold that is designed to do that. So, Chris, I, w I wanted to ask, why is it that very intelligent people that have very good journalistic writings, writings, like you have a book coming out soon. Why is Sub Substack the choice of platform? Let's face it. After a night with drinks, I don't bounce back the next day like I used to. I have to make a choice, either a great night or a great next day. That is until I found Zbotics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste the day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. 
ZBox produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's of sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Order Zbiotics now for your summertime barbecue, weddings, vacations, you name it. Go to zbiotics.com slash mscsmedia or scan the QR code on the screen right now to get 15% off your first order when you use MSCS Media checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code, so you can stay prepared no matter the time or occasion. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money-back guarantee, so if you're ever unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, head to zbiotics.com slash mscsmedia, use the code mscsmedia at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, remember the days when you're always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up, BlueChew.com. BlueChew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever the opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, aqua conversations, waiting in line at the pharmacy. BlueChew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Does it work? Don't think you need it? Try it free for a month and see. You're going to love it. You could be missing the best sex of your life. They say there's nothing sexier than confidence. And Blue Chew can help give you the confidence where it counts. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use the promo code MSCS at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com promo code MSCS to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast form to write such type of things. Well, Tommy, it's like this. It's you get deep platformed any place else. Most people who were on Substack were originally on something like Patreon. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, I hate to say this. I don't know what your legal constraints are, Nothing. but uh, Patreon deplatformed us for no reason whatsoever and stole 6,000 bucks from us. Mm. And uh, that's when we went to Substack. They, de- they deplatformed sub- you for this kind of stuff? The, uh, no, they wouldn't even tell me what they deplatformed me for. Holy so shit. There was no, there was never an explanation. We tried and tried and tried to get an explanation out of Patreon for why that, and, and we were actually working our way up. We had a good following on Patreon. Boom. Wow. And, you know, we say, well, what happened? Was there anything wrong? Up yours. You're done. Wow. And that's it. Wow. That's what these people do. I mean, they're, they're disgusting. I mean, I can't I can't stand these people anymore. Anyway, Substack hasn't <laughs> pulled that on me yet. So until it does, uh, Substack it is. That, that, that's a new ringer. I yeah. never heard that one before. Wow. Oh, they're, 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 and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. I mean, you, you can go hire a lawyer and you can go to court and you can go through the motions. And, you know, what they say, you can't beat the ride, right? Mm-hmm. You, you you know, paying all that money, shelling out to a lawyer every day, it will kill you one way or the other. So there's yeah, just, by, most people don't fight it. By, they by, just by walk away. By the time you're and, done suing them, you have no, you, yeah. you spent you know, all, the, all the money that you could have made from it, you lost. And they're going to win and, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, many years sometimes. Yeah. So I, I've been through that before. I've had, we've had like, you know, two or three lawsuits, which I had to handle. I had to write the briefs and all that jazz myself. And wow. it takes a huge amount of time. Yeah. Right. Hell I always win, but, but it's, it's, it takes time to do that. Right. You've actually got to, I mean, and there's a lot of, you know, courtroom protocol that, uh, you know, a guy, unless you have a law degree, you don't know all of these things. So you have to hire a lawyer to submit your briefs and so forth. And, and, uh, this, you know, leads to a, a great expenditure of time. <sighs> I just can't and, uh, believe over this. Yeah. Out of all things, that well, obviously you're onto something they don't want other people to know. Yep. There you go. Well, uh, well yeah, yeah. It's basically, it's basically, I say what I want to when I want to say it. 
it's as simple as that i mean i don't there are certain things that you can't really talk about without endangering your freedom of expression in other words they're gonna they're gonna you know what they like what they don't like well for example what you're showing right here they're not gonna like that well luckily, i don't care luckily don't we're care. on we're on spotify and i'm under contract so we can say and do whatever we want precisely i'm gonna i'm gonna <laughs> more or less tell it the way i see it beautiful um, i'm i'm a compulsive truth teller so this is what happens love it so take take me through this this is interesting Okay, well, this is just basically about a concept. They say it's a conspiracy theory. Let's, you know, we, we might as well maintain open minds about that. The conspiracy theory is called white genocide. And the idea is that, you know, white people, it's not blacks that are endangered. It's not Latinos. It's not, you know, any of these other groups that are endangered, but white people, because we seem to catch all the discrimination these days. We're terrible people, uh, you know, uh, uh, white supremacists, domestic terrorists. You know, I mean, they've got us pegged for all kinds of greatest threat to America's democracy <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, that's that's the kind of, of thing that I think we need to address. That's a problem, so we need to talk about it. And here I'm talking about an aspect of the white genocide theory uh, that says that COVID-19 and the vaccines that were manufactured to uh, allegedly to prevent it, that these things are somehow directed toward the destruction of, of white civilization, white society. Uh, and, uh, you know, all the lockdowns, they've more or less crippled the economy over this thing. We've got all kinds of, uh, of side effects and nasty things happening to people now. I think we need to address that. This uh, illustration that you're pointing at right here, that's uh, basically, I think this is from 2020, but it was basically the number of, of infections and the mortality count for COVID-19. And uh, as you can see, I live in the American heartland. That's the uh, that's the extremely red part. If you look over to the left now, this is OK. We've got you've, you've got three panels here, three, three dual panels. OK, the first column, that's uh, non-Hispanic whites. That's the NHW on top. OK, then you've got non-Hispanic blacks. That's the second panel. And then you've got Hispanics or Latinos over here on the right. OK, so these are your these are your, you know, those are your rates of infection and mortality. Hmm. Well, you see where most of the infections and mortalities happen. Mm -hmm. OK, they're happening with the white panels right here. OK, now that means that whites are paying an inordinately high price for these for COVID-19 and the vaccines that were that were produced to to, uh, to treat it. Mm -hmm. nobody's talking about this you know oh, it's wow. like well everybody's equal and everybody's getting equal amounts of vaccine absolutely false the vaccines were pushed mainly in western in the western world there are other you know nations in which they've pushed vaccines fairly heavily india for example i think has had a great deal but a lot of these countries don't have the same kind of vaccines that we have their vaccines aren't as damaging as ours are okay the pfizer vaccines moderna johnson and johnson astrazeneca these vaccines have turned out to be a little bit more of a serious proposition. They were supposedly going to be safety tested before they released you. They're supposed to safety test vaccines, of course. They were neither safety tested nor were they tested for efficacy. In other words, they don't cure COVID. Right? They don't no. prevent COVID nineteen, and they're as unsafe as ten kinds of hell. Yes. Okay. So what are they doing? Proven. Releasing them on, on the Western world, mainly the Western world, which uh, which contain majority white nations. Why are they doing this? Okay. Well, these are questions that we need to ask. In my opinion, they're up to no good. Okay, so that's why I wrote this, you know, looking for comments about it. Find out what people think. As far as I'm concerned, something needs to be done about it. Um, and well, it's, as, it's as simple as that. Well, and then I'll go to the next tab. All right. And then, Chris, the, the FDA was ordered to release the Pfizer documents. We had Amy Kelly in. And you mm -hmm. can actually put in, you can literally put in the batch number of the vaccine that you got and it will tell you uh you know the percentage in 13 years you're going to have a heart attack is this if you got this batch six years so on and so forth based on the batch say the guy stopped at the gas station and got coffee and smoked a cigarette and it got warm then the purity of that batch went down because it got warm so it wasn't as strong but there's some batches where there's a 98 percent mortality rate Within 13 years, like like the other day, LeBron James's kid, that kid. Yeah, I heard about that. I heard about. Okay, now LeBron's he's 18 kid. years old, Chris. He's got the best nutritionalist. We know that the best athletic mm -hmm. people in the planet. You and he was pro vaccine, but you know LeBron won't come out and say, "Hey, 
my kid almost died because of this because, in my opinion, LeBron's too worried about the three four hundred million dollars in contracts he has. Rather he works than for China Inc. Yeah. yeah, fucking right, he does. <laughs> right, so he's not going to come out and say, you know, it's only my son, uh, and people will actually listen to me. And I know they're giving thirty five dollars to everybody who's in prison to take the the shot, and they do it. Well, my son is sick. Stop taking it. But that will never happen. Mm. Yeah, it's a very sad situation. And unfortunately, a lot of people who should know better and should be speaking out, like LeBron, aren't in a financial position to do so. Now, in my book, you lose your soul for that. You can't, you know, you got to speak out. If something like this is happening, uh, you've just got to talk about it. You know yeah. what I mean? <clears throat> I don't care who's paying you what. I don't care who you work for. Uh, you just got to say something. Uh, yeah, at, at some point, it, it's, it's beyond that. But they, they don't. They're, they're all in cahoots, and they're, it's all about the greed, in my opinion, and the, the, the population. I uh, ex Exactly. There's a link, I think, to, what is it, what's my batch.com or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I'm referring the, the, to. The, yeah. That's yeah, what there is a link. Them. Yeah. There's a link to that down in this document somewhere. Yeah. Um, it but is uh, then, uh, then to, to get back to the, to the white genocide theory, the other thing that they say is, why did we have over 100 million third world immigrants? You know that were the borders were held open illegally, and why were they let in to the United States and other Western countries? Why did this happen over the course of fifty or sixty years? What are they all doing here? Why were they brought here? It's not as though these people were vetted. You know, it's not as though we said, "Okay, what can you do for the United States of America? Are you a doctor? Are you a are you a uh, construction engineer? What can you do?" And this is what immigration law used to be. Instead, they just tore open the, uh, the, the tore open the borders and said, "Come one, come all." So you know, no matter who you are, come on in. We've gotten a lot of you know. I hate to say this, I don't want to be unkind, but we've got a lot, gotten a lot of people who probably shouldn't be here. Yeah. Okay. They're they're not they're not adding anything to society. Why are over a hundred million of them crawling all over the place now? I mean, most of them aren't working. So there are a lot of jobs here anymore. All the jobs were offshore to Asia. Okay. Most of our factories are in. What are these people doing here? Are they out there on the highways and on the roads, you know, reconstructing our infrastructure? I Absolutely haven't seen not. that. Like, I haven't seen that. So I think what's happening is most of them are on assistance of some kind. And meanwhile, they don't like America. <laughs> they don't like Americans. So it looks to me that a lot of people think that this has something to do with trying to crowd white people out of their own countries. And in the case of the United States, when you go from from 90 percent white in 1950 or 1960 and you go to 56 percent white which is what it is right now in 50 or 60 years this can't happen naturally no. this is not a natural occurrence this was intentional so granted that it's intentional why would anybody intend something like that well whoever they are they're not our friends okay it's as simple as that that's where the white genocide theory comes from so I believe we need to talk about it because it looks like there might be something to it, you know, it's and, as simple as that. And then who's who's behind it and, and what's the point? Well, what's the point? So you want I mean, obviously, you want the population. You got this whole trans thing. You got everything possible to divide. You know, remember before it used to be just racism. You're black. I'm white, blah, blah, blah. Now you have every type of division possible. Like, a lot. you know, you talk about religion. Religion is what causes is wars. War. I mean, I mean, all these wars are are basically religion, unless it's political. Okay, so you're these getting, days they are, but of course, there's just one religion that is especially warlike these days. Yeah, you which, know, and of course, you know yeah. that as well as I do. Yes, of course, of course, and you you add that all together, and it, it just creates a mess. So, what is behind the border being wide open? I guess to get that, rid of the whites. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's yeah. it's uh, it's basically divide uh, and conquer, or divide and conquer. Okay, Jeez. multiculturalism is a scam. It came out of the Frankfurt School. You know how that works. Basically, yeah. it's a scam that is meant to, you know, you you force many many having many cultures on Earth is just fine. You know, I used to like the idea. Of, well, I can go to you know Africa and visit Kenya. I can go to Europe, visit uh, France, and you know hang out on the uh, on the Mediterranean. Whatever you want to do, you can you can always travel to go to other people's cultures. Taking all of these disparate cultures and jamming them in close mm -hmm. proximity, right in into I close see. proximity with each other, this is a recipe for disaster. I see. And now only a sense. fool could could have been blind to this fact. I right? see. 
I see what you're so saying now, Chris. Yep. From the very beginning, I mean, you know, here you got, you know, people, they operate differently. They have a different modus operandi. They have different ideology. Of course, they're not going to get along. Why cram them into close proximity like this? It's obviously, it's called auto ab chaos. Yep. Okay. Yep. Not in France for order out of chaos. Okay, what you do is you take all of these different cultures, you jam them into a country that is that is dominated by people who may turn out to be your opponents. You're, after all, you're trying to conquer the country. Okay, that's that's divide and conquer. And then once things really get really bad, once the society starts to fall apart because of this multiculturalism, well, then you've got it's time for the Great Reset. Auto ab chaos. Auto ab right? okay, yep. We've got these these little tokens that we can just move reality right into our, you know, right. tokenized and isn't it, world here. Isn't it funny, Chris, that probably I'm just going to take a wild guess, the Bill Gates of the world, uh, the Elon Musk, they'll be okay at the top. But everybody oh, else, they, 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 they certainly will be. But you know who they work for. I mean, this, yeah. this whole idea, you know, I get a big kick out of Elon Musk. You know, those self-made billionaire. Yeah, okay. No, his his grandfather was a, he was the he was actually arrested. I think he got in a lot of he was a, one of the uh, he was a, a big shot in the technocratic party in Canada a long time ago, right? Oh, and I, uh, I heard that you know, basically, basically, Elon has been groomed, and this idea, you know, he for a long time, Elon was pissing me off, and here's how he was doing it. They were calling up everybody who had a show and wanted to talk about the simulation hypothesis was calling up Elon Musk, right? And tell us, tell us about the simulation hypothesis, Elon. And Elon kept on pontificating on it. And, you know, it's like if you put in, uh, you know, into Google, if you said Elon Musk simulation hypothesis, at the time I did it, it was returning 5 million hits. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, you know, with all the quotes and everything. So. He was regarded as the world's greatest authority. Well, guess who was the first person to apply the simulation hypothesis to an actual problem? Tesla. Who? Wasn't it Tesla? The, the well, I, not I, really. Tesla. No. This was pre. Tesla was pre-computer. Um, he wasn't really into the computation. I thought he had done um, it with math. Sorry about that. Well, you know, there's nothing to apologize for. Tesla was a brilliant guy. Wouldn't surprise me to find out that his thoughts were kind of wandering in that direction. But it wasn't Tesla. It was me. It was in 1989. Okay? It was 10 years before the Matrix came out. Now I'm really right? sorry. Now I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So he took that and ran with it. <clears throat> and while you bring Elon up, I must ask you this, and then I, I want to go to some of your stuff. To me... He seems groomed as groom can be, buys Twitter for double the amount. I say this at nausea, but you're the guy I want to say this to. He buys Twitter double the amount, gets uh, Tucker, you know, encrypted messaging. Everybody runs over, sign up, sign up, sign up. Then after he does all that, all of a sudden, he decides to make Linda, whatever her last uh, name is, yeah. the most censorship vax pro person on the planet the CEO of the company, and then furthermore odd, four days later, Neuralink just happens to get to stage three of FDA testing for approval. Just well, he, he does this stuff all coincidentally. The time. I mean, at, and then, Chris, <laughs> go outside and run with your kids because we're going to limit the amounts of tweets. You mean you don't want people searching around too much of other people's opinions. So if we limit it to 600... We're going to put in front of your face what we want you to see, but we're going to tell you we want you to go get air. Right, right, right. Uh, you can take a close look at Elon, and I mean, just look at what he owns. His companies, uh, you know, uh, Skylink, you know, with his 5G um, satellites and uh, tunnels, and Neuralink, Neuralink, where he wants to, you know, chip everybody. And, you know, and that would be great for the Great Reset, by the way. It would be very convenient. You just put a little chip right here <laughs> in kind of the web between your thumb and your forefinger and just, you know, wave your hand and, hey, they know exactly how much money you've been allowed to keep right then, you know? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Elon has a long history of this kind of thing. He's not, he is a, a, he is a facade. Elon so. is, he's a, he's a chimera. He's, he's basically, he serves a function, okay? Um, his function is to exemplify the American dream. The American dream isn't doing so well these days. Right. <laughs> but but there's Elon Musk. Oh, wow. The savior. The richest the savior. man. In the world. He's got a quarter of a trillion dollars 
and from nothing the guy came from nothing yeah except for the uh his allowance was paid in emeralds <laughs> from his daddy's emerald mine when he was <laughs> nobody mentions that I mean, part yeah nobody mentions that part now, so you know elon has he's been groomed from jump street and you know all these guys they're in with the uh you know most of the i would say that most of the uh of the alt media these days is probably run by the cia yeah okay you know, got cia people in there they recently found out that almost every you know the hollywood is absolutely completely infiltrated with cia Jesus. you know so this is what we're dealing with with a guy like elon musk you know i'm not saying elon is all bad but i mean look at the stuff he says you know like oh wow you know we need more children you know we, we've got to actually have more population growth you know otherwise you know america is going to disappear Right. We got 300, almost 350 million people in this country. And you it's have growing the fantastic, wide open. especially with all these immigrants they've been letting <laughs> like, in. And fuck? here's Elon telling us, oh, we need more of that. Right. I mean, who does this guy think he's kidding? I mean, is he really that dumb I, that he I, can't figure out that, you know, we, we do have a population problem? You know, it's see, just getting worse. I, I think he's playing that role, Chris, of that's the arm that no one's looking at. So you look yes, at Obama and you're like, oh, you know, he's a disaster, Clinton, whoever. But Elon, you look at it, he's the savior. So he's that arm that no one's really looking at what is really going on. But you got one guy that has all these things. You know, it's like, you know, back in the day with like kings and emperors. One guy with all that power. That never turns out Dangerous. good. Well, it's not just one guy with all that power. Well, that's power. the thing. It's that's not, not just Elon's money. Yeah. That's not Elon's money. That quarter of a trillion dollars. Elon has employers that he has to satisfy. And the minute he stops satisfying him, he's in trouble. Life-threatening trouble. What That's you... what I think. That's what I think about Elon's financial independence. I would have to agree highly. Where do you see Israel in this? Are they behind a lot of this? Well, you know, that's difficult to say. Uh, Israel has a lot of influence and a lot of power. You wonder why a tiny little country that w was founded, you know, in the late 1940s, I mean, it's brand new. You wonder why this tiny little country has that much power. Oh. I mean, you know, when, when uh, Netanyahu, other yeah. Israeli, you know, uh, uh, political figures, diplomats, people, you know, he comes when he comes to the U.S. Congress and he gives a speech before the Congress, he gets a standing ovation. That's what I mean. I mean, standing. I mean, what is that? I mean, how the how does that happen? Okay, well, it's very obvious why it's happening. It's happening because the world banking system and financial community is controlled by, by a set of bankers who are very proud of being Jewish, and they had something to do with the founding of Israel. I think it was uh, Lionel Rothschild who uh, had something to do with uh, the Balfour Declaration and, and the. Uh, the foundation of the state of Israel. And, you know, they also had something to do with the founding of the UN, too. So this gives them a nation, an actual seat in their own world government body. That's kind of see. a big deal. Yeah, it's a very big deal. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all, I mean, you got to give these people aren't stupid, right? Yeah, like they're stupid smart. in some ways because they think we're so stupid. Right. But, you know, they, they actually have managed to figure things out. They got nothing better to do. I mean, hey, if you're a Rothschild, you don't need to work. You know? You're <laughs> yeah. not flipping burgers for a no, living, right? No, that's out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can just, yeah, and, and not only can you do the thinking yourself, but you can hire all the greatest, the finest uh, technocrats, People accountants, financial experts, you know, uh, uh, tech wizards. You can hire all of those people to do it for you. So that's what we've got. We've got basically a financial community that is dominated by the same people who have been dominating it for the last 200 years ever since uh, since Nathan Rothschild took over the the uh, the British economy when he bailed the Bank of England out right uh, you know ever since then the Rothschilds were the the premier financial uh, right. uh, force the financial enter the uh, it was it's really a dynasty in the world by the end of the uh, by the end of the the 19th century, they were reputed to have half to control half the world's wealth. Okay. Now, you know, I keep saying, you know, everybody says, I, you talk about the Rothschilds, you know, they're obviously very cultured people. Uh, and, you know, financially, they're, they're really on top of it, huh? you know. Uh, and, but people say, well, yeah, but that was a long time ago. Okay. Yeah. Nathan Rothschild, you had all these fantastic, you know, the, they, they controlled banking in, in Europe. But, you know, people encounter setbacks, you know, families like that, they lose their money. 
you know, I mean, here's, here's, you know, some guy who goes out and gambles it all away, or, or maybe he gets a wife and she, you know, divorces him and takes all his money, you know, so the money just disappeared. This is not what, what that can't happen in this case. Okay. Because it's a system and that system is like a black hole. Yeah. Once it contains a certain amount of wealth and a certain amount of capital, there's no way for it to escape. It just keeps sucking more and more in. So, you know, if, if someone wants to say, well, the Rothschilds are not really running world finance, right? What they need to do is they need to point out the exact financial setbacks that caused the Rothschilds to lose all their money. Okay, just do that for me. Okay, come on out. Let's hear about the history. You know, let's hear how what these setbacks were that took control of the world banking system away from the Rothschilds, the Schiffs, the Warburgs, all the rest of these guys. What were those setbacks that actually changed the entire, you know, financial landscape? Now, show me that and I'll change my mind. But until then, knowing what I know, it looks to me like the financial world is still dominated by the same people who dom essentially the same people who dominated it 200 years ago. Because no matter how many years went by, the principles, the, the basic principles would be the same. You, you're just adjusting to the That's time. That's exactly right. It's, it's called compound interest. And yeah, compound me, interest. Yeah. yeah, the money, it's a one-way thing. You know, once you develop enough, uh, develop enough capital and you wire it into that compound interest system, the money just keeps on pouring in. It doesn't just pour in. It's faster and faster and faster it yeah. pours in. Right, 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 right now it's coming through like, uh, <laughs> it's coming through like a, a Mack uh, truck uh, on uh, steroids. To, to be very frank with you, I think they probably control almost everything in the world. I think private ownership is now at a, an all-time low. I think that, you know, basically there's just not that much available anymore. You know, uh, there's certainly, you know, I mean, can you, like, for example, in the in the 1800s, you know, if you were in the U.S., you could establish a mining claim. You could just go out and, you know, or you could, there were special claims where pioneers could go out west and they'd get 200 acres, you know, their own farm. And this was an incentive, so they'd go and settle this. There's no place new to settle anymore. There are no more of these grants. Nobody is getting this. The only way you get any land anymore, any kind of property, is if you already have a lot of money. Right? That's it. Okay, so where does that leave most people? Most that people don't already and would start out with a lot of money. So financial opportunity has, you know, spread its wings and flapped away. And and this is uh can you pull up tab three? And and this is the basis of how they are right in front of our eyes and people aren't seeing it where as they take and take and take, we have to depend on the government. And then you have your one world currency, basically like you referred to, they give you a cell phone, they give you a paycheck, they rule you until you go extinct other than the elite is what it seems right. to me. Over well, time. That's, that's, that's exactly what it is. I mean, that's what this great reset is. These, uh, these, uh, uh, this, it's the tokenization of the economy. Basically, they've got a real world with a real economy, and they're doing very well there. But they don't have the complete control they want. They don't dominate everything. They can't micromanage your life. So what they have done is they've taken that entire economy and shifted it, in, uh, shifted it into a simulated reality, a token world where everything is tokenized, and they can that attach is. their, you know, their their bank credits, you know, to a certain number of those to everybody's name along with their social credit score. Okay. Social and then, credit score. Yep. Uh, yeah. And then, if if there's if you do something that they don't like, they can just put a few demerits on your social credit score and subtract everything from your bank account. And well, oh wow, that's it for you. That's yeah. it oh, for well, you. We own you. We're right. And there's nothing you can do about it at that point. So once you let them tokenize everything and move it into their own false reality, which they completely control, then it's too late. You can't do a thing about it. Chris, how right? far are we away from that? Get, just oh, we're, very, we're, 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 it's like this. It's very, very scary. Close. It's very, very scary. It scares, scares the hell out of me. Um, and it scares the hell out of anybody with half a brain. But there are a lot of people who think, oh, wow, I can't wait. I want to get my chip and, you know, and just wave my hand and then get whatever I want. <laughs> you get whatever yeah. you want as long as you toe the line, as long as you're, a, you know, a lick spittle, a toady, uh, a sycophant, as long as you're that then they will give you, they'll sprinkle a few crumbs on you. Right. Right. It, and it's, it's not as though they ever worked a day in their lives. These yeah. Guys, these, these bankers. I mean, they don't work. They haven't worked for centuries. I mean, they, there's just no question about that, but you have to work. Okay. And in return for your work, they'll give you a few little crumbs that they conjured out of nothing. Because you have no other choice. But you have no other choice. 
<clears throat> they've they taken everything. They own everything. You're basically renting your life from them. And, and if you stop paying them yeah. their rent, then you don't have a life anymore. And their and their rent includes what they want you to do and say. Well, that's precisely right. Yeah. So so, the, the, so we're all their slaves, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The idea is that you should be a kind of a little bot, a little robot that they can program to behave in exactly the way they want you to behave. And as long as you do that, then you get these crumbs sprinkled on. But if you don't, then <laughs> the crumbs dry up and now you're in trouble. And, and talk about your ultimate reality. I, I think this is great. And uh, Chris, by the way, not that you need it, but your writings, your YouTube, everything is very simplified and comprehensible if you're just starting to get an interest in this. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what is the question exactly? Tom? Okay. We have up uh, your ultimate uh, reality uh, page. Yeah, well, all right, just well, let's put it as simply as possible. Yeah. If you black box reality, if you just say, okay, reality, everything that exists, everything that is, you've got you've got a, a, a black box. Just imagine there's an object, okay? It's an operator, which means that it does something. It's a reflexive operator, which means that it's doing those things to itself because it's self-contained. And the two things that it does to itself are identify itself and model itself and attribute existence to what it models. So it's basically identifying itself and attributing existence to itself. It's as simple as that. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, that's trivial. It is not trivial. <laughs> Logically, <laughs> it has to assume a certain shape, you know, a certain structure in order for those conditions to be met. As simple as they are, right? And that's what the CTMU does. It develops those logical conditions. And we end up with something called the reality self-simulation scenario. Right. Which basically says that reality is a simulation as it is in the matrix, but it's not some clunky simulation where people are in pods and connected by cables to some central processing unit. OK, all of those cables disappear and everything comes together in one seamless reality, one system. So this is uh, this is and as far as the structure is concerned, if you want to get into the logic of it, it turns out to be a certain kind of language. That language is called the metaformal system. And there's a paper on that, and uh, and yeah, it's very exact and it's it's uh, very uncompromising. And there's nothing ambiguous about it. A lot of people think that uh, that ultimate reality or metaphysics, metaphysical reality, is somehow mushy. You know, that somehow, you know, it's ambiguous and kind of nebulous, and nobody's really talking about how things really are. I talk about exactly how things really are, and there's only one way to do it. Yeah. Which gives me a little bit of an advantage when people want to argue about it. Now, uh, go to the next step. Now, when they when when they have this quantum computer, go to the top. When they have this uh, quantum computer ready, uh, well, what what uh, you think they're going to have a quantum computer ready soon, huh? Well, I've heard such. Okay, I, am I wrong? There's something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and you can't get away from it. Basically, the, the, the history of quantum computation is trying to get away from the uncertainty, inherent uncertainty of, of quantum mechanics. They're doing good. I mean, they've got a lot of clever ideas on how to do that. But when they implement these clever ideas, what they're doing is they're cutting down. They pay a price for it. They're cutting down on functionality. So, you know, the quantum computing has not thus far uh, fulfilled its promise. And the promises that are being made for it are basically uh, for their... It's because it's a new and expanding branch of the economy. Uh -huh. See what I mean? Uh -huh. Right. I In other you. words, this is a way to make money. This is a we're way to make money. We're having a hard money. time coming up. We're having a hard time coming up with new inventions, new tech that we that we can make a lot of money off of. So I'll tell you what. Even though we're not sure that we can make quantum computing work, <sighs> let's make it the new thing. Right. The and, new and thing that everybody has to invest thing. in. And so that's where everybody is. Same thing is going on with uh, with artificial intelligence. I, I mean, see. that's an oxymoron. So, so they'll so they'll call the T three modem the quantum computer, basically. Go to uh, basically, uh, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like artificial intelligence, you know. It's it's uh, it's uh, oxymoronic. And really. your your YouTube uh, great. Cause see, see, quantum quantum computation is an oxymoron because computation is a mechanical process, but you know, then they call it quantum, which is a different kind of mechanics entirely. So quantum computation, those two words don't really go together. So you're you're hard pressed to explain how they fit together in one concept. 
motherfuckers. Another, excuse my language, but motherfuckers, yeah, another, another marketing tool. Another marketing tool, these yeah. bastards. <laughs> that, that's that's basically it. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't make money off. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, you can make, but it's it's entirely hype. In other words, it's what people believe about it. It's what it's whether they expect it to pay off. A lot of people do expect it to pay off, but they're being a little bit unrealistic about that. And Chris, at the very least, they're at the very least their timetable is screwed up. We've had physicists in that I know you know, and they are they are dead set that this uh, quantum computer is going to change the way the universe, what we know about the universe and this and that by 2027. But I guess they're going to be uh, a little bit disappointed when it's really just a T2 connection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I mean, I, you'd have to, you'd have to tell me specifically what, what physicists you're talking about and what they're saying about it. Exactly. But uh, it sounds to me like, they're, they've been sucked in with the hype, you see. I, I, I so, think so, so. String theory, yeah. if that rings a bell. Yeah, yeah, string theory. Yeah. You know, string theory purports to be a theory of everything. Yeah. In some sense, I mean, it's got valuable insights, you know, on on what a unified field theory, you know, might look like. That's not a theory of everything. A no. theory of everything is a blanket theory that explains everything, not only the objective universe you know not only the, the world of science where you make observations but also what's going on in here you got the external universe and then you've got the internal universe and that explains nothing about the internal universe right right mm. <laughs> and your youtube channel that we have up uh like i said it is very simple the videos are great uh keep posting up i saw somewhere i read an article uh, i used to watch i don't know if you used to watch or it was just referred to. Remember Coast to Coast? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my wife was, uh, I think she was, a, uh, and I've been on Coast to Coast once. Oh, were you? I used to listen to it every single night before I went to bed for a decade at yeah, least. Yeah, I, I was definitely on it. Hey, Jeannie? Oh, oh wow. And no, just, who, who, who was the guy who interviewed me for Coast to Coast? Uh, he just passed away. Oh, I got to look him up. Oh. Who, who was the name of the interviewer on Coast to Coast that interviewed me? Oh, that was um. The guy just died. Uh, that was the one who lives in Las Vegas. Art uh, Bell. Art Bell. The, yeah, it wasn't Art Bell. Art oh, Bell was the original. George, George Knapp. No, I don't think it was Knapp either. I think I can find out. I think yeah, it's, it was another guy. Oh well, congratulations! Yeah. That that was one of my favorite. Every single night, Chris, for over a decade, I put him on. You're talking about Bigfoot, all kinds of oh, just right. interesting stuff. That was a good ten years ago or something. That, that yeah, he passed away. He he overdosed. Art Bell did. Art Art Bell did. Yeah. yeah. Art Bell was a very interesting guy. Yeah, he's. I very... mean, he was. He, <laughs> he 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 had a lot of people spellbound. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. did. Hey, he had me. <laughs> he had me locked and loaded. I I didn't miss that for anything. I didn't know if it was Bigfoot one night or Godzilla or <laughs> or if a UFO was actually uh, coming down. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So and, you know, there's uh, you know something to be said for talking about that kind of thing. But you know, I think it's always just good, even like the conspiracies that are as crazy as crazy gets. It's just always nice to have somebody's thought because you never know what could come out of that thought. Well, exactly, exactly. You know, you, you can't get to any new insights unless you talk about things, and uh, you know, shows like Coast to Coast, they're willing to talk about anything at all, no matter how weird it is. So and this is this is how new ideas come out. That's how they emerge. Gets people to think. And well, what could it be? Now I, I saw that you had uh, done your SATs and fell asleep after you did them, or you taught yourself everything. I mean, you I, got... I fell asleep. I fell asleep after <laughs> nearly every test I took. It was like it was like narcolepsy. Right. Honestly, I like like I you know. I'd be working on it. Sometimes I wouldn't even finish it, you know. I just and I'd start feeling these waves of sleep come over me, like, and I couldn't fight it, you know. Yeah. And then one day I found out I was sitting in uh, in, <laughs> in I think it was a junior in high school, and uh, my I had a teacher, an English teacher, who entertained the whole class. I found out after the fact by coming and 
snap their fingers right in front of my face <laughs> like this <laughs> wow. and i was standing there with my eyes sitting there with my eyes open i saw nothing i was completely i was someplace else <laughs> that's were... the kind of thing and that's the kind of thing that uh, that's that's how it was for me i was bored out of my wits growing up cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid but as i got older started working out i had to watch out for sugar and empty carbs magic spoon has the amazing flavors you'll love but high protein and less sugar the variety pack, four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. This pack has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs. Only 140 calories per serving. It's high protein, zero grams of sugar, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. The fruity one, I'm done for. I can eat the whole box, no problem. Go to magicspoon.com slash mscs to grab a variety pack and try it today and be sure to use promo code mscs at checkout to save five dollars off your order and magic spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a hundred percent guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason they'll refund your money no questions asked that says something remember get your next delicious bowl of high protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash mscs and use the code MSCS to save five dollars off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Are you the man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels have dropped substantially since the 1980s, at about an average of one percent per year. Think about how old your father was when he was born. For example, if he was 30, your testosterone levels could be 30 percent lower than his. Low testosterone levels can have all type of health effects on men. It can affect your mood, sex drive, memory, muscle mass loss, you name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but it can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available from your secure online account within two to five days. So... If you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash MSCS media and get 25% off your test using the code MSCS media. The link is in the description at the top. I bet. Yeah. Now, now with having, you know, with the intelligence that you have, did you have trouble communicating with other people like peanuts? Like what, what is like the average IQ? Like a hundred? One hundred. Like the peanuts, like well, us. It, it all depends. Yeah, different groups have different peanut IQs. Because I know with me myself, and I'm, you know, no, not when somebody has something, some stupid idea that is just so non intelligent and makes no sense. I being, you know, an, a, an Italian guy from South Philly, I'll say like that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like that's your business idea, like eyelashes. That's really what you're thinking about for the last week. So for you. You know, being so advanced, how do you be, like? Do you have to balance that up there, up top? Well, uh, there's something called the double life strategy. Okay, yeah. You, you, you're talking a certain if you if you, you're surrounded by intelligent people who actually have a little bit of awareness, you know, then you've got one presentation. Then you can start, you know, talking as you would talk to such people. But when you go out in the world, I mean, I you know worked a lot of menial occupations. Worked construction, worked as a bar bouncer, was a fisherman for a while, a firefighter, you know, all this kind of stuff. When you do that kind of thing, you got to turn that off, man. You know, you don't keep that that high IQ stuff going upstairs when you do that. I mean, you become a regular guy. Well, I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. Is, you know, the way I grew up talking to people, you know. But then, you know, then when, when it comes time to turn it up, then you can turn it up. That's a double life thing. You develop that ability if you have to. I mean, if you really need to, if you're... If you're going from, you know, you're with a bunch of regular guys or, you know, guys that are even more stupid than average, right? <laughs> uh, but, then, but then you're getting together with some really intelligent people. you got to develop the ability to do that. Now, now, like, before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning, well, what's the first thing you think of when you wake up and go to bed? No, that's a good question. See, what I do before I go to bed is there's a problem I've been working on. Maybe I've been working on it that day. Maybe it's another problem. It's something that's been on my mind. I'll, I'll, you know, write it down, and then I'll begin trying to drill into it. I see, okay, what don't I understand about this? And I'll start 
drilling holes into the problem that that you know go down you know a certain to a certain depth as deep as i can drill you know and i drill several of those holes then i go to sleep now what happens is connections form among those holes that i dug that i drilled in this problem before i went to bed when i wake up in the morning there is a there's actually most of the time whether it's luck or whatever it is but basically i have a web of connections a kind of a, uh, a, it's a sort of a plexus of meaning that then I can simply tap into at will. In other words, I, I prime things, I program my mind to work on something overnight, and it does so in the background. I see. Right? So, at night, some- so at night you have a problem, you poke holes in it before you go to bed, you, you figure out the areas. While you're sleeping, your mind's filling those holes. Then you wake up and can see it and can put it together. That's right. That's exactly what happens. That's, that's unbelievable. Well, I wish yeah, I could. Do it. it might it might be more common than you think it is. It's just probably something that people don't. Well, I, I don't. I, I don't think you're thinking but, about where you're going to hammer a ham uh, a nail or a screw. So my guess is the things that you're thinking about and poking holes in before bed are way beyond, uh, you know, building a table. <laughs> they do tend to be abstract. <laughs> they're, they're, they're problems that nobody else has solved. I thought you he was know, it's, it's it's things that okay, we need a new approach to this. What's it going to be? Okay, so you start out, you take a look at it, and you say, okay, well, wait a minute, what does this term mean? What does that term mean? What is intelligence? You know, what is consciousness? What is what? What do these terms actually mean? And there's no definitions for them. I mean, if you actually take a look, definition for intelligence, you know, that's well, that's what intelligence tests measure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, why are they measuring? You know, I mean, how, do, how does so that? So, what are you work? measuring actually? Right. Yeah, so you look, you yeah, you look for things that are hard to define, and then you go and you form tentative definitions and you see if they overlap in any way. And then you kind of fill those, you, you, you define those overlaps and then you go to sleep and, and in the morning, there it is. And then what is sleep to you? What is sleep to you? Well, what is sleep? I, I seem to be a little bit weird in that respect, which is that there's, you know, most people, they go to sleep and they wake up not being able to remember what happened. Okay. I remember everything. In mm-hmm. other words, when I dream, I usually I'm conscious of the dream. On some level, you know, I see what's happened. Now, it's not that I, you know, people talk about lucid dreaming. I don't necessarily get into the dream and try to change it. Instead, I just watch it. What happens? Something is trying to communicate with me, you know, about something that's going to happen, already did happen, some situation that exists. And so I'm going to pay attention to that communication. And I'm going to try to decode this when I wake up. So this is, you know, this is something that I do more than other people. Now, is that dream, you know, a different dimensional dream, a different reality when you sleep? What is that when we dream? Are, are we in another reality or just a dreaming? Re- like, what what is well, it? Because it's more than just I go to bed and I I have a dream that a gorilla is next to me. Well, uh, you know, that's a language. You know, all of these things like that gorilla in your dream are yeah. symbols. They're the symbols of a language. So what happens is when you have a dream, it is actually speaking a certain language to you. What you've got to do then is try to interpret the dream, which means finding out what that language is trying to tell you. What, what the, this, There was a message here. Okay, how am I going to decode that message? So you work with the symbols you've got. And you can usually figure it out. I mean, if you actually put things, to, how does this relate to that? How does that relate to this? You can actually put those things together and come up with a, a reasonable interpretation of what the message was. Right. That's just, usually the way. That's just, usually the way. Just like when people do mushrooms or DMT, they see crazy things. And then a month later, they realize that that thing that they saw or that experience that they had, this person was no good. I got to get them out of my life. And six months later, they realized that that person was about to rob them. Right, right. And exactly. I'm just yeah, in, that, in a different type of way. That, that, yeah. That's the kind of thing. A lot of people, you know, who do psychedelics report that kind of, you know, delayed insight. Right. And then talk about the uh, Mega Foundation. Well, the Mega Foundation is something that was uh, established by my wife and I. We met through the high IQ community. And, uh, you know, they've got you got Mets, and then you've got these ultra groups that are more exclusive than that. We were both a member of, of a couple of those groups. And so that's how we met each other. And uh, and uh, what the hell was I talking about just now? Uh, the Mega Foundation. And they, right, right. And I was going to say that your, your wife's also a neurologist, right? 
Uh, she's a clinical psychologist, uh, you know, actually oh, okay. a neuropsychologist. Okay. Technically, a kind of a kind of psychologist that is called a neuropsychologist. That's a very intelligent home a, there that you got. <laughs> well, you know, a psychologist who knows more about the brain yeah. uh, than most people do. Perfect, anyway, we perfect got match for you, buddy. <laughs> and and the, the thing is, this the high IQ community is completely, you know, Lance Ware and other people who put together Mensa had the idea that it was going to be this think tank. That solved important problems right. for mankind. That's what Mensa was supposed to be originally. Turned out to be a bunch of, you know, I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but, you know, a bunch of party people that just wanted to get together and uh, and BS and mm -hmm. drink a lot, right? <laughs> and uh, try to get in each other's pants, right? This is basically what it turned out to be. So then you got these higher, more rarefied groups that thought that they were going to be the ones that were going to actually fulfill the promise of the, of the high IQ community. They turned out to be roughly the same thing. The more rarefied the the group of high IQ people, the more pointless bickering goes on. I mean, they're just constantly at each, you know, trying to one up each other. Well, right. I'm smarter than you are. You're not smarter than I am. And it just goes on and on and on. Finally, my wife and I got sick of that and we figured, okay, we're gonna have to, you know, actually try to cut through, cut to the chase here and say, no, this is the way it's gonna be. And we're not gonna, you know, let people just join you know, qualify for a, for a group and then be able to totally mess it up like this. Okay. We're going to have a, we're going to have a nonprofit foundation that will consist of high IQ people, but it's going to, you know, be a non-member organization that is going to be dedicated to solving some of these problems that people like Lance Ware were talking about. So that's what the mega foundation is. That's awesome. And then that way, when you have it, when you pick them like that, instead of everybody bickering, you, everybody works together for a common goal precisely and that's very good because it's kind of a, there's a wellness aspect to it people you know the more intelligent you are the harder it is to talk to other people uh so you kind of get a, you develop this loneliness you know? i mean this sense of isolation um and something like the mega foundation where people get together and they have they have uh social media essentially uh, in which they can talk to each other and converse about intelligent subjects, you know, with certain rules in place, like, no, we're not going to tolerate, you know, your, your, your knockdown drag out with this other guy <laughs> here, you know, we're going to try to keep it constructive. I mean, this is something that can be very healthy for people. And it helps, you know, it, it helps cure their isolation. And this is something that we, uh, we try to do for intelligent people, because a lot of them really need the help. Yeah, and Rob and I talk about it just from having in guys like yourself, Hoffman, <clears throat> other people as such. And you go home and you you try to talk to somebody about it. Hey, look, you know, I really think that we're in some sort of interface. And they just look at you like you got a tin hat and they're back to their TikTok bullshit or, <laughs> or whatever it may be, you know. And the more I do this, the more I come home and people are like, Tommy, I really think you're losing it Tommy, with this podcast. Okay? Yeah. Like the and I'm like, oh no, 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 no! You don't understand. I know. I had. I know. I know this is right. You know, and uh, but I could see how beneficial that would be because just me, just from having done this and learning what I've learned, and then I learn a little bit more every time. Who do you talk like? Just me hearing it, not understanding it mathematically, but understanding it enough where I believe it, I see it, I can comprehend it. Like I'd love to have somewhere just to throw ideas back and forth to get up to date. Yeah, exactly. But, but there's nowhere exactly. to go because you're you're just labeled some lunatic. Precisely. That's the kind of thing that tends to happen in most social media. And it's the kind of thing that we avoid at the Mega Foundation. You know, we try to maintain open minds and really talk about, you know, how things and the CTME really helps with that, by the way, because it's a broader framework in which you can interpret a lot more uh, of what most people consider to be paranormal phenomenon yeah. for example you can talk about well you know is there life after death is there such a thing as ghosts what about ufos what are those that kind of thing you can actually talk about it in this expanded framework in a way that you can't if you're just locked into this physicalism framework that most people use right well everything is you know if i can do this then it's physical and you know that's what it, everything has to be explained in terms of otherwise it can't exist right and, and it's great too because you can go on there and read what all, what you guys are saying to each other. So if somebody says, "Hey, Chris, what do you think happens when you die?" which I do want to know what you think. <clears throat> but you get a real answer, like an answer from somebody who studied it, then you get this answer, that answer, and nobody's a weirdo. You get genuine intelligent answers rather than, "Well, this says this." 
you know, right. and nobody's laughing at anyone else. No, you know? nobody's no. nobody's you know just subjecting anyone else to mockery, right? Which is tends if you go out on ordinary social media, it's crawling with trolls, right? Trolls. I as hate soon it. as you say something that the troll can latch on to, yeah, you know, you're in trouble because the troll is going to latch on to it, right? So you know, there's a little bit of a civility thing going on, and uh, and uh, people are that, that you know it's surprising. It's been very rewarding having the having the mega foundation because you do meet a lot of people who you might not think you know they're not necessarily connected. They don't work at a university, you know, they're not some sort of a, of a science uh, uh, expert, but nevertheless, they're extremely intelligent. They can come up with ideas and put things together in new, in novel ways that can actually, you know, bring insight to everybody else, right? So if you're just open-minded about it and you look at what someone says carefully, and even if they haven't been quite, you know, uh, exact in the way they express it, if you just try to figure out what they meant, you know what I mean? If you really put in the effort, you can really get some of this. Right, and then you build from them. And you build from exactly. them. You all build from each other as a community. As much as you may not disagree, there has to be something that that person might be close to on, or or whatever it may be. I just think it's a yeah. great thing because I'm so into it. You know, yeah, exactly. If you were in the studio, you'd see I got stars on the ceiling. I got a UFO thing here from uh, what was his name? I don't remember his name anymore. Uh, after uh, talking Harry, to guy, Harry. no Bob. Bob Lazar. Oh, Bob, Bob Lazar. I was oh, Bob Lazar. Yeah, I was okay. stuck on Bob Lazar for a while. I had him send me a UFO thing. So I've been going down this rabbit hole for a minute here. So Yeah, yeah. Well that's that's only natural. I mean, these things are interesting to talk about. You know? So what what do you think happens when we die? When we die in this reality, what do you think happens? Well, I think there's a mapping attaching you to the G-O-D, which is the Global Operator Descriptor, which is the distributed uh, identity of reality. There is a mapping called neomorphism that attaches you to that identity, okay? And when you die, you can be retracted into the non-terminal domain of the metaformal system, okay? And then you can actually be transferred to another existence. Which could be anything. That hub, from that hub. I mean, you know, the, Zuckerberg, for example, uses a term the metaverse, right? Yeah. Okay. We're talking about the functionality of a metaverse, how a metaverse would actually have to function. Okay. Zuckerberg doesn't know anything about it. You know? <laughs> no. But uh, as, as far as I was probably the first person to use the term metaverse, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure about that. There's a science fiction guy that, that Zuckerberg credits for doing that. But I've been talking about the syntactic metaverse for years, which is an aspect of the CTMU. Yeah. I saw. So I saw a paper in 90, 89, you wrote, 90 maybe, and you were saying meta. You should have copyrighted that. Chris, what are you doing? You got the- Well, it, it, it's automatically copyrighted. I know. I copyright know. law is written in such a way that as soon as you write a paper, it's basically copyrighted to you, <laughs> unless you put it out in the public domain and kind of invite people to use it. Yeah. Right? So, what you're, you know. so what you're saying is you think when we die, we go back to, say, a base, and then in simple terms, like a base- and then you get shot out if to you another. Qualify. If you qualify, if you qualify, if you qualify, and and what what would be the standards to qualify? Well, if you're a serial killer, you're going to have a hard time getting retracted to the base again because the base doesn't want anything to do with you anymore because you're a serial killer. But but how? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Well, yeah, but how if you were born into a family that beat your brains out, mentally just destroyed you, and you turned into a lunatic just by way of. I don't even want to say the way of reality that exists at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, there still has to be repentance. You've right. still got to actually realize that you did something wrong. Okay. You, you had a, this problem. You were beaten as a child. You were abused. You've got the wrong idea. People actually told you that certain things were appropriate and acceptable that were not. You've got to realize that. And you've got to sincerely desire with all your heart to make an improvement in yourself. If you don't, then you can't be retracted because whatever you're retracted to, you're going to take these these same uh, problems that you have here. You're going to retract. That's those are going to be retracted with you. And the base, you know, is you know this God thing that I'm talking about. This is something that is perfect. Okay, that's why you want to be retracted to it because all of your cares are wiped away. You are not allowed to bring problems like serial killing 
his base. So this is, you have to be there. There has to be a block. There has to be a filter that filters you out if you're contaminated. And people can get contaminated through no fault of their own. But at some point, you've got to realize what is happening to you, and you've got to try to come to a better way of doing things. Now, if you're willing to do that, then you can always be forgiven. You can always get salvation. Uh, what most religious people would use are the terms that they use regard, you know, you can seek the forgiveness of God, okay? But if you don't do that, if it's, well, yeah, I'll, so I'll serial kill any and anyone I want to anytime I want to, and, you know, God has to forgive me because I'm a person too. That's not the way it works. <laughs> That's not the way it works. But believe no. me, it can't work that. It can't work that way because you you could contaminate something that has to remain pure. It has to remain pure and invariant so that it can distribute over everything and everybody symmetrically. Okay, but if you're the kind of person who isn't consistent with that, then you can't be retracted, and your afterlife prospects are limited on that account. So would that coincide with say I get a gut feeling? And my gut or my instinct, my natural instinct in this reality says, I know this is wrong, but I go the other direction and I do the wrong. I do. So my instinct is telling me something's wrong, but I do it anyway. So now I'm headed, I'm headed to go back the wrong way because my instinct or my inner somewhere is telling me that this isn't the right choice, the right thing to do. I'm going the wrong way. I go kill somebody. But that, that, that uh, instinct or whatever you want to call it had told me this isn't a good idea, even subconsciously. Th th would that coincide with the two? Because now that you had said that, when we had uh, Joven Pulser on, he created, he invented the QR code. And that guy had the worst upbringing on the planet. Mm -hmm. And he talked about it openly, you know, raped by his father, beat everything. And he came out fine, just perfect with the family. So That's some people do. So he just chose to go with his gut to get in the car, to get away from everything rather than go be a drug dealer and kill everybody. In a sense, you know, I'm just trying to make it simple. Right, right. Well, okay. If he actually succeeded in curing himself of these moral flaws that he had, if, if he actually had, it takes a good deal of, uh, you got to be committed to improvement. I mean, there's a price you pay. If you want forgiveness, if you want to be retracted, if you want to be part of the family again, the human family, that means you've got to shape up, okay? That takes effort. So it's not as though you can just say, well, guess what? I'm not going to serial kill anybody today. I've decided to straighten up and fly right. So for the time being, anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to commit these crimes. That's not good enough, okay? It's got to be something that goes very, very deep. You've got to transform yourself. And this kind of transformation is not easy to accomplish. So you you got to be very careful. I don't know anything about the fellow you're talking about, so I can't say in his case what the story is, but uh, uh, it's not easy. And, and how like, do you find the, the, the worse the worse you've been, the worse things you've done, the harder it's going to be. If you want to give yourself over to Satan and Satan owns you, obviously it's not going to he's not going <laughs> to let you <laughs> turn around and, and choose to do the right thing. All of a sudden, you see. So what you know, and you didn't have the the easiest upbringing either. So well, no, so I certainly didn't. No, yeah. but I, you know, I usually don't talk about it very much. But uh, yeah, we had uh, there was quite a bit of uh, domestic turmoil in our family. You know, the family was broken several times, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I, you know, there but for the grace of God. I mean, I could have ended up. You know, there were people who thought that that me and my brothers would uh, would end up. <laughs> up in a maximum security penitentiary <laughs> before we hit adulthood, but we didn't. Good we didn't. Every single one of us turned out to be, we straightened up and flew right. You know what I'm saying? Even though we had this, it was kind of a brutal thing. You know, I mean, we were, you know, pretty much the old man would, uh, you know, uh, he was a little bit of a, not a very gentle guy, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So we had a lot of that kind of problem. And uh, nevertheless, it's possible to get over it. To say, okay, well, this was an aberration. What what has happened, you know, to us? This is not the way it should have happened. So we're going to proceed normally. Pretend it didn't happen. Okay, and we're going to do things right. If we have a family. We're not going to abuse the kids, right? And then how much? That's of... what my brothers did. My brothers all had good for had families all. and they're wonderful fathers. Good you know? for good good for you and your family. I'm very man. proud of them. Yeah, all of you, all of you. And then what, what, what did that, that had to, in some way, given you the drive 
the 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 drive to just keep working hard more than just an, a high IQ. Like you still got to have drive, right? Oh yeah. And what gave you the drive and why, why do you think you went down the route of trying to figure out what all this is? What, what sparked your interest in just trying to figure out these super amazing complex questions? Well, just wanting to know what reality is. I mean, here we, we have a life we're given this life that we live, but we don't really know what it is. Right. And if we, if we inhabit reality, there's something called reality out there. We don't know what that is either. And because we don't know what we are and we don't know what reality is, we don't know what the proper relationship between the two is. In other words, we don't know our asses from our elbows. Right. So at some point, if you have any intelligence, you know, and, and you have enough intelligence that you think you can solve that problem, then you're going to go ahead and, and, and do it. And if you've had the kind of upbringing or the kind of life where you've been isolated, or you've noticed that it's all a clown show and that it's probably better things you can do with your time, then that will give you all the more incentive to work on these problems uh, by yourself. I was always the kind of person who didn't mind being by himself. I was a forest service lookout for a while. You know, I can stay completely by myself for months at a time and just be perfectly happy about it. A lot of people can't do that. A lot of people, especially nowadays. But this generation oh, yeah, cannot be alone. It is oh, these kids. These kids crazy, right there, you, know, you watch their little thumbs going as they, they, you know, tap on their smartphone. I don't think I could do that. I got these like fat thumbs. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't own a cell phone because we don't get cell phone service here at the ranch. I held my, I held on to the BlackBerry as long as I could because my fat thumbs weren't good with the iPhone. So I held <laughs> on to that until there was no. BlackBerry just torched themselves because I couldn't feel anything. I, I yep. think it's the worst thing ever, but. I haven't seen you be too concerned about AI. You don't seem too concerned to me in what I've read about AI. Is there a reason well, I, for that? Yeah. It, well, here's the thing. If you have any kind of tech, the first thing that they're going to try to do with the people, all of the tech is owned by people that own the corporations that manufacture the tech. Those are all rich people that are members of, of the overclass, right? So the first thing you have to ask is, well, given any given you know, given any particular kind of technology, how weaponizable is it? You know, can, can the overclass take it and weaponize it against me? Right. Okay. Now, AI is something that they can weaponize the hell out of. It's very obvious that they can do this, right? That's what they're doing. All of this computer security, all of this surveillance, you know, technology that they have, all of the uh, the bots and the, uh, the AI that they're using on social media and chat bots and all the rest of it, all of this can be uh, very dangerous. Yeah, they're sitting on this great big pile of data that they, to which they never had access before the present time. What are they doing with that data? Well, they're abusing the hell out of it. They can follow you around. They know microscopically what you're doing at every, at every, especially if you have a cell phone. You know, they can literally track you in real time using devices like this, and it has gotten them spoiled. Now they think, well, they're letting us do it. You know, they're letting us surveil them like this. I guess they like it. We might as well know everything about them. Wouldn't it be cool if we could put something in their body that would tell us 24-7 what's happening, you know, inside them, you know? Yeah. And of course, if you can do that, if you can stick something in that will monitor a person, monitor their thoughts and behavior, well, you can also, there's the possibility of being able to control that person through the same interface. All right. You see? And so this is the way, this is the way they think now. Okay. AI is very, very dangerous for this. I think Elon Musk has been talking about that recently hasn't he mm -hmm. what a danger ai is and of course that's you know that's it's kind of like the uh, the uh, pot calling the Look, i was just you gonna know, say the that the yeah. Yeah. yeah you know meanwhile uh, back at the ranch he's got yeah. seven different <laughs> chips to put in yeah. your head yeah. you know exactly so so anyway <laughs> i used to tell people that, that that if i had been in charge of artificial intelligence we'd have it by now and we certainly would have more than we got but you've got all these little you know these little millennial munchkins and people graduating from when they go there and it's all you know about software and programming and you know how can we make money how can we get a new innovative program that you know actually helps the government keep tabs on us yeah. and this is what they're doing oh that's what all half of this ai well half this is what damn near all of it all is, of it is uh. basically designed to help the government keep tabs on you the citizen right this is damaging as hell our rights are going down the toilet. Our privacy is going down the toilet. So I'm not terribly, I'm not a big fan of AI. 
And I am very careful. I, it's not something to which I want to contribute unless I can trust the people that I'm working with. And the way it is right now, I mean, who the hell are you going to go to work for? You're going to go to work for Google? Well, you know, it's going to be abused. Then. And most of the other companies that you can go to work for as an AI specialist, as an AI tech, they're going to be the same kind of company. Right. It's going to be weaponized. It's going to be used against the public. Something I'd rather not have on my conscience. You should build. You should build one. Mm -hmm. You build one. After you, after you finish with your I book, I should. I should, but I don't have the resources. Yeah. Right. Right. That right. <laughs> that, that'd be like uh, that. That's the thing. You know, when I when I first went down this rabbit hole of what you do, and you and Hoffman make the most sense about everything. Your articles are real easy. Everyone else. I would ask them certain questions, high-end astrophysicists, so on and so forth, and they would start to answer, and then they would swing it. And what I realized is it's because of grants. They got to stop themselves because they want that grant at Hartford, Stanford, wherever it may be. You and by it. doing so, they're just putting a roadblock in humanity. That's that's absolutely correct. That's that's correct. There are too many people willing to take those thirty pieces of silver and sell the rest of humanity out. <laughs> yeah. Right. All you got to do is, well, what are my stock options? You know, do I want to sell humanity down the road? Well, what are my stock options? What would I get out of that? That's what your average college kid is now thinking. I mean, this morality is down the toilet. I mean, they don't really have a conscience anymore about what they're doing to humanity by pursuing these lines of endeavor. AI being one of them. And speaking of AI, I, I think it's just completely nonsense to think that they're not going to be controlled because th this is fascinating. I could type in anything and get anything I want. I could scan anything, blah, blah, blah. So just like social media, the government comes in, and even if you don't want to go along with the, the agenda, your option is going to be we're going to take down your site and you're going to have nothing or you're going to – to do it you're gonna your results are gonna come out like this well that's that's exactly what happens yeah, yeah that's those are your options you either play a ball or you're out that's it i mean you know i'm one of the heavy uh, i might be the most canceled person around you know I, I realize there's some people out there that are pretty damn canceled but it's been going on for a long time i don't know of people who actually do interviews like this you know i did an interview with the daily wire not too long ago um they actually Flew my wife and I to, uh, to uh, where the hell was it? Nashville. Flew us to Nashville. Did this whole big thing with uh, Mike Knowles, and I met Jeremy Boring and other people who owned the company. They were all just absolutely elated about the interview, right? And it was going to come out in a couple of weeks. They pulled it. They pulled it. Hmm. Somebody told them to. I don't know who the hell it was, but there are people running around, and if they think that you're not playing ball. They are going to make sure that you get screwed in this way. They, you're going to make sure that you get canceled. Yeah, the Daily Wire pulled that interview, wow. uh, basically deep-sixed it, and as far as I know, I'm the only person they ever pulled that on. Wow. Right? And there was no reason to pull it. Now, just a little bit after that, they it was when they, about a month after that, I think, is when they signed Jordan Peters. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of thought to myself, why would this have happened? And I thought, maybe... This was a, a play to get Jordan Peterson to sign. Maybe they were in negotiations with Jordan. And Jordan was like, you know, dragging his feet. And, you know, they finally wanted to light a fire under him. Mm. So what did they do? They brought in another guy who's even smarter than Jordan Peterson is. Okay. So that's what I, I think. See. That's what I think may have happened there. But they still should have shown it. So why, well, you know, why didn't they? I mean, they still could have shown it even after they hired Jordan Peterson. Right? So why? Would they would they just suddenly up and we ask them for a reason why? But you know, can we ask why you're not showing this interview? No answer. So you never that's how you know you're getting canceled. Yeah. If they don't have a good reason for it, then you know that somebody is calling them up and saying, Guess what? We don't want this interview shown. We don't like this guy. We don't trust this guy. This guy is saying things we don't like. So if if we see this interview on the air, you're gonna pay the price. Well, Chris, okay. I don't care. So I can promise you that this will be on Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, because the one, whichever God can call me up, <laughs> I don't care. 
So there's that. There's the end of that. So believe me, it will go up. They can call me. They could threaten me with some contract bullshit. It goes up. Fuck them. All right. Okay. You're crazy. Well, I'm going to hold you to that. Well, I'm, listen. Uh, well, let me tell you, these guys could be hard to resist. I don't care. We're uh, we're both old school Philly guys. Yeah. I've been through way worse threats. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> now, I believe it. I oh believe it. fuck! Back to yeah. Well, uh, I wish I could have done my SATs and took a nap back then. Jesus. What do you think about SATs holding so much weight? Oh uh, well, you know a lot of people criticize standardized testing, um, and they say, well, that you know there are cultural biases that are built into these tests. I don't think that a lot of them are aware how much effort has gone into getting rid of cultural bias and actually making these tests culture fair. It's called culture fair. Um, I think that now we have tests that do give you a pretty good, pretty accurate representation of how, you know, smart someone is up to a certain level. The ceiling of most, uh, most IQ tests is about 160, 165, right? Uh, you got two kinds of IQ. You've got ratio IQ, which is little kids. You know, if you have a 10-year-old who's as smart as a 20-year-old, then that's too, too high of IQ. But those, those kids tend to regress as they get older. And finally, you get something called an adult IQ, which is measured by IQ tests like the WACE, for example. And that is a more accurate representation of how, of how smart you actually are. Those tests are pretty accurate, and they are also they tend to hold constant in time. If you, for example, score 140 on the waist when you're 20 years old, you're likely to that you're likely to stay. That's likely to remain your IQ score for a long time, right? So this is you know you have we need and IQ scores by the way these tests you know achievement tests IQ that they do correlate with achievement in certain lines of work, right? Certain abilities that you can have, certain talents that you have, they do correlate with that. And that's why the school system still uses them, right? And that's, that's why they're still widely used in placement, for example, okay? But it's they're not politically correct. I mean, because groups that have a lower mean score on these tests constantly think they're being discriminated against. They're not. And, and and placating them, mollifying them and saying, OK, well, even though, you know, your your average, you know, mean group IQ appears to be 75, even even though it's really, really low, we're going to go ahead and promote you anyway. And we're going to give you this job and that job and we're going to give you grants and uh, and loans. You want a loan? OK, we're going to give you all of this stuff. This works very much to the detriment of society. Yeah, people people end up unqualified for the positions that they get. OK. There are smart people that are left, you know, by the wayside, you know, basically, you know, go watch TV and drink beer, right? Whereas these other people that were allegedly oppressed or, you know, had some sort of a cultural disadvantage, these people end up with jobs they just can't handle. They just don't have the ability. So that's what I think. I, I don't like to see, you know, anybody discriminated against because they have a low IQ or come in with a low test score. That kind of bugs me, but... It's sake, you know, don't expect them to function as a university president, you know, if that's if that's the problem. Right. Yeah. And, and to have one test to cipher, like when I was in school, that was the big deal. <clears throat> that SAT man, everything. I don't God knows what it means now. Who knows? But but now I, I can look under a microscope and tell you every cell in COVID. I can tell you how the brain fires. But if you tell me to build a table, mm -hmm. Chris, I can't build a table. I have to be interested, and then I'm zoned in, and I can literally break down everything with COVID. I can break down cells and how A1 receptors work and stuff like that. Like, it's nothing. I know I don't look at Chris. I see you looking at me a little crazy, but I actually can. You can ask him. I can I can tell no, you. No, no, I, I actually <laughs> believe it. I know, I know guys like that that absolutely – but when that, that it, hate, hated school, didn't hate do very well in school, but they end up being one hell of a lot smarter than they looked when they <laughs> yeah, were in school yeah. like later in life. You just weren't motivated, you know, they weren't stimulating you enough, or there was some other kind of problem, you know. Uh, it's, you know, and I had the same problem to a certain extent. A lot of my teachers thought that I underperformed as well. And you what know, do I you, did, I did, you're in the middle of your book, right? I know you had, right. you hurt your knee. I was, we were trying to fly I keep in on for rewriting seven months. It because yeah, I keep on rewriting it because this is, you know, supposed to be the 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 layman accessible version <laughs> of the CTMU, and I keep on looking at it and saying, you know, if I was a 
a layman would I really understand this? And then I have to go and rewrite it and try to, you know, dig under and make it more clear. And uh, so this is a recurrent process. That's what's taken me so long to write this current book. But uh, I am making headway. So it shouldn't be that, that much longer. I love it. And now that I think about it, I think, because I've read a lot of your stuff, I, I think that they're suppressed. One reason they're suppressing you is because if people attach on to that and they keep reading it, I tell a friend, another friend checks it out. That kind of gets rid of religion in a way. And if you kind of get rid of religion in a way, you take money. So what I'm saying is like when I, when I read through your, your, your things that you write, it makes it as if there's, I interpret it as, you know, you have Christianity, Catholic, Muslim, all this other stuff. If all that's gone, right? And we're more focused on conjugative things, reality, not such this religion ball game. We're just all trying to work together. Well, there's something. Okay, now this is a very interesting topic. You're right. Okay, there's. Uh, uh, first of all, let me say that there's a purpose for religion. It has often been abused. People have, have used it to oppress the masses, con the masses into doing certain things. But really, religion has proven to be an indispensable moral foundation. Right. In other words, when this country was largely Christian, there weren't as many crooks as there are now. There weren't as many criminals as there are now. Fear. Okay. There was, you know, people were God fearing. They thought, well, if I, if I sin, if I, you know, do commit crimes against other people, there's going to be a price for that. You know, I'm going to have to pay it somewhere along the line. Religion was good. It served a purpose. That's that's a that's a reliable purpose. Unfortunately, religions contradict each other. Right. Right. That's the they, problem. They contradict. And, and here's the problem with religious scripture. I mean, people say, okay, this is the absolute truth. Religious scripture. You've got to interpret it. Any written work that you have is going to need to be interpreted. Right. If you don't interpret, if 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 you know, if I hand you a children's primer, you know, a, a kid's book, right, and I hand it to you and I say, okay, can you you know can you read this? The first thing you're going to have to do is interpret it in order to read it. You've got to interpret the symbols. What are the, what is that symbol? What is that symbol? What is that symbol? When you combine them like that, what do they form? They form a word. What does that word mean? Okay. It's next to this word here. What do the two words mean when you put them together? This is all interpretation, right? A scripture is the same way, right? The Bible, the Quran, um, you know, the Talmud, you know, all of these religious texts, they're the same way. They have to be interpreted. And unfortunately, they don't tell you how to interpret them. No. There is no standard mm -hmm. metaphysical framework into which they can be interpreted. You see? Okay, so the next step in religion is finding that one master framework in which you can attribute, to which you can uh, map all of the religious insights that have been generated by all of these religions and their scriptures, right? And so that's what the CTNU is. That's what Basically, I meant to say, Chris. Yeah, Chris, that's what I meant to say. That's right. what I was trying to say. <laughs> so that's what we have to move on to. Yeah. We have to move on to a meta-religion, which is a metaphysical framework in which all of these religions can be convergently interpreted so that they're consistent with each other and don't go to war with each other and, and find themselves in mutual conflict all the time. All right? Okay. All you have to do is know how to construct it, and unfortunately, most people don't. They're constantly talking about... Uh, Okay, now I've lost my little Zoom here completely. There are a lot of people that talk about uh, the syncretistic things that are going on in the UN, for example, where they're talking about, we need a world religion. These people, a lot of them are very wrong-headed. I mean, they might be, you know, they might be well-intentioned, but they don't know what they're doing. This is a, this is a surgery. It has to be surgically done. I mean, you have to know logic, you have to know mathematics, you have to know a lot of things that, you know, and you have to know them well before you can do this properly. And unfortunately, those people have nothing to do with the UN. They have nothing to do with the new world religion that they're going to set up. That's all syncretism. That's where they're taking this ritual and that belief, right, and that sacrament from this or that religion, and they're kind of throwing them all, making a hodgepodge out of them and saying, okay, this is going to be the new world, meta, or, uh, uh, the new world religion. Okay, but it's not a meta religion because it doesn't have the proper logical structure. You can't interpret all of these scriptures in it so that they make sense. You see, that's what they're not providing. So we need that. We need that. The, the meta religion is the new state of of theological consciousness that we need to stop arguing about things like God and uh, and good versus evil and the other moral conundrums that we've been facing for centuries. 
and and what you mean just to take you back to the beginning so when people <clears throat> read through what you wrote you know if you believe Adam and Eve ate an apple okay what you're reading in the scriptures that Adam and Eve ate the apple but what was the apple what was Adam and Eve what was the circumstances around it because as you said just reading it you think Adam and Eve ate an apple and all of a sudden everything appeared which to me is just hilarious but <clears throat> I'm an asshole but if you look at it <laughs> well it, it's, it's metaphorical you have to know it right it's but a metaphor it, and it has to be interpreted right so I look at it like okay well what was the apple what was Adam and Eve? What happened? And what you're what saying- was the serpent, right? Exactly. What was the circumstance? What was the tree of knowledge of good and evil? All that right. Stuff. Then you go into, like, say, the Quran. See what happened in the Quran around the same thing. And somehow, right. uh, intelligently, put that together so that everybody can agree on one. Not, not just like, botch, 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 here, this is it. Mm -hmm. Right? Exactly. Then everybody's exactly. happy because everybody got a little of their peace- that makes sense. That would be a beautiful that's, that, thing. That's right. That would be a beautiful yes, thing. It certainly no would worse. be a beautiful thing, wouldn't it? It's one of the. It's one of my greatest hopes, and it's a large part of the reason for what I've been doing. I really, really want to be, you know, and I'm. So it's largely already there. I mean, the framework has been built, you know, and I've, I've, you know, been interpreting, you know, various theological statements, religious statements, uh, in this system to show people how it's done. And uh, we're going to go a lot farther in terms of spelling it all out so that we get the meta-religion that we need. But that's the whole thing. You need a, a religious meta-language. It's got to have certain logical characteristics. And once you have that, then you can, okay, you can map all of these things convergently into it so they can cohabit there. They can live together in peace. They can coexist. Harmony. Yep, coexist. They can coexist. Correct. Now, what about the stone tablets? Are you familiar with the stone tablets, the writings on the stone tablets, the from however many gazillion years ago and you can transcribe them and all of them seem to have something from the Bible within them. Are you familiar with any of that? Stone tablets. Well, of course we all know about the stone tablets that Moses brought down. Um, but no, I'm not familiar with these particular stone tablets. Am I, am I saying that wrong? The, no, the one that Carson was talking about. Well, that was a cave in the cave, wasn't it? Yeah. Am I saying it wrong? Though? It's just like the writings, almost. Yeah, the uh, Billy Carson had come in. He's, <clears throat> you know, he's got a lot of good theories. You know, open mind type thing. And he had brought up these stone tablets that were found in caves that had a lot of scripture writing on them, and so the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that. No, it was basically they were they were like they're in a cave that like it's so hard to get to. And they had like writings almost, I think on the walls, basically, of like, it would be like a, an animal or a, a, a person that looked like half animal, half person, right? That was written on the walls. Right. And, okay. And, and, and to, to make a long story short, so they found a bunch of these, they transcribed them, and it, it, it told the evolution of the earth or of the universe where... The Earth was really a planet that got broken in half, and we're the half of another planet. Do you know any of that stuff, or is that just all? Well, this is stuff? the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It sounds to me like there's metaphor there that it's basically an ancient cosmogony or cosmology, and that's the kind of thing that would have to be interpreted. Uh, you know, you're not talking about the Nag Hammadi. Okay, actually, uh, no. I, I think I'm talking about the Nag Hammadi. I don't remember the name. Yeah, right. The, that's the, the Nag Hammadi. There's there's a lot of stuff that never made it into the Bible, for example, that was originally supposed to make it into the Bible because the, it had a, a questionable provenance. Something seemed off about it, so it was kind of excluded, or it was inconsistent with what the powers that be wanted people to think back then. So these these are like books of the Bible that were kind of like excluded, and there's a whole body of this material that's out there, and a lot of it is related to Gnosticism. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. And and there were a lot of a lot of Gnosticism is heretical from the point of view, for example, of the Catholic Church, right? the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, so it it is included in the Bible. When you buy a Bible, all of a sudden you have to buy that extra. You have to you know go and buy another. Book oh, you got to buy another that contains one. All, oh, all okay. of this other material. Oh, okay. And a lot of that's and what you we're talking about sounds a little bit about uh, uh, you know it sounds a little bit like some of that stuff 
that appears among those excluded works. Yeah. Right? Those ideas, you know, but uh, no, as far as the stone tablets are concerned, not familiar with them. And of course, as Rob was saying, uh, written on cave walls and things like that. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and other things were found. They were actually actual scrolls that were found in caves, you know, fairly inaccessible caves uh, in the Middle East. Um, but I need a little bit more information before I can put my finger on exactly what we're talking about. Sure. Well, last couple of things, because I don't want to abuse your time. <laughs> what, what do you think about past civilizations? You know, I, I always being that I no longer believe that the UFOs are coming down here because I can't seem to understand why Impressive. anybody who could bend time <laughs> or find a way to get here, you know, 15 billion light years away would suddenly happen to crash on earth. And there's not any evidence of anything at all. So I, that's out the window to me. And then the way that they're presenting it. So I always thought, okay, well, how do you go from, a car phone when I was growing up, my friend Franco had a car phone. Everybody wanted to be in that car because his mom had a car phone in the Cadillac. You know, <laughs> we're piled up to get in this guy's that car. That was like a rich kid. <laughs> yeah, he was a rich, <laughs> rich kid that sold pizza. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, and then within, you know, a decade, you have the iPhone and all this crazy technology. Was that there? What Did we find something from a past civilization and were able to reverse engineer it? How did that come so quick? Because I look you at know, it like a, so, yeah, uh, ahead, that's a sir. very interesting question. As you know, some people think it's it's uh, alien technology. I some no people... longer do. I'm off of that road. I no longer do. Thanks to people like you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, the fact of the matter is that there have been a lot of things that have come to people through the power of the human mind that you wouldn't think would have come to them. No, you mentioned Nikola Tesla. You know, he could actually see blueprints of the designs for the machines that he made. Could actually see them, detailed wow. blueprints in his mind. His mind had the capacity to do this, and it's a it's a, a capacity that is is not very well understood. But some people have the power to actually pull this stuff out of the air. Now, an interesting question is: Well, in order for them to pull it out of the air. Must it already exist somewhere mm -hmm. in space and time? Must there be some dif distant civilization that had this technology and somehow it kind of traveled through space and time and now it's in the air so that we can pick it up out of there? Like a frequency. A very like a frequency. Well, a little bit like a frequency, yes. Yeah. And that's a very interesting question. Uh, another interesting question is, could it be somewhere in the future? And people are just transfer tra transferring that that future information even though it doesn't already exist somehow getting a hold of it and pulling it back through time so that now they have access to it and mm. these are all you know different approaches to the uh, uh to what it is me i have no problem it's in the air a lot of this information is in the air so you can think of it there are however some some and as you know i mean thinking of things like lasers for example they're not at all obvious i mean you've got to be a real specialist in order to know what you need to do that, right? Either that, or you've got to be some kind of, your, your brain must be some kind of antenna that is pulling this kind of information out of the air, right? But we shouldn't uh, underestimate how powerful the brain is and how easily it can actually pull information like that out of the air and put it together. It's all part of the way our brain really works. It's not just a computer. It doesn't just process data like a computer does. It's way better than that. It downloads it's like an too. antenna. It functions a little bit like an antenna, you know, that, that, that actually exists and extends out into deeper levels of reality, right? And can pull stuff up from those deeper levels. Is ones or in general, is, is the future in a somewhat way, shape, or form already written? No. No? We have free will. There is there, a lot of people, you know, free will is a, is a hotly debated issue. <clears throat> People have it or not. Um, yes, we have it. Okay, there's no question about that. Okay, because there is no background against which the future can be determined. And the universe is background free, it's self contained. So basically, the universe has to make its own future, right? So the universe itself has free will. And if the universe has free will in that sense, then the universe can transfer free will to its images. In other words, the little its components, which are basically mirror images of it, 
I that, what I'm trying to say is that the universe is self-similar. We're all microcosms. Right. You're a microcosm. I'm a microcosm. Rob is a microcosm. So right? we're just images of the universe as a whole. So if it has a property like free will, we're going to have that property too. Interesting. Right? And there are there are more technical reasons why we have to have free will as well. Basically, right. all that free will is is it means you're creating the medium along with the states. <laughs> In other words, most people think there's a fixed manifold, right? Some kind of a grid. And that you grid, can make yeah. laws, laws of physics that are parameterized within this grid, right? And that those laws of physics determine future events, right? But there is no fixed grid, okay? That would be a background. That would be a an external background. There is no grid. So that grid has to be built. It has to be synthesized from scratch, right? So it's not as though you can, say, predict future states just by referring to this fixed background. You've got to determine the states and the grid and the background at the same time right? to have the full that's free picture. Will. That's, that, full, that's, that's free will. Yes, that that's free will. So then, when we go back to the UFO thing, do you, do you think there's other life out there on other planets far away? Do you think they're coming here? What, what what's your thoughts on that? Well, what I think is that we live in a universe where there are the universe is made out of something. It's made out of one basic universal substance it has to be and that's called monism. monism okay monism means well the universe is idea the universe is matter right well whatever people think the universe is made out of the universe is actually made out of something called telesis okay and this 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 uh, this telesis is something that can be factored into reality this is this happens through through certain processes that uh, that uh, that we go through and uh the universe is constantly creating itself. It's in the process of creation 24 7. And there are a lot of logical things that you have to know about this. Like I said, this is a, the, the metaformal system and uh, quantum metamechanics and, and the reality of self simulation principle, which are some of the papers I've written on this, on this topic. There's quite a few technicalities there. So it's not that easy to understand. So, so what was your original question? Again? So, like, is there other life out there, or is there other intelligent life out there, or is this just what we're seeing in this? Oh, no, no, reality? no. What, what I was, I'm sorry. No, no. What problem. I was going to, what, what I was going to explain was that, that there is actually this telesis, this protean meta substance that makes up the universe. This stuff is constantly looking for opportunities to nucleate, to self. It's it's a potential. It wants to self actualize. So it's constantly looking for things around which it can self-actualize. Okay, these and this telesis actually consists of you can say that it consists of future realities, possible futures, right? There's a possible future that wants to nucleate the present right now, right now. so that it can actualize itself over time, right? right. In other words, it's listening. It, it currently exists in a non-terminal realm, which is, means that it's not actualized yet. But if it gets in, if it can actualize itself here, then it can actually exist in the future. And be real. Right? It can guide itself, uh, become real, because it, in other words, it will self-reify, self-actualize. Okay? So this is how the future is actually created. There are, there are things, there are telons. We're getting a little bit, you know, into CTMU uh, uh, meta mechanics here. But there are telons that would like to steal what we have here to make their own future out of it. They would like to displace us because they're not us. We have our own, you know, our own identity. We have our own, our own uh, telic uh, entity. Okay. These are different, but they need our resources. So they're trying to actualize themselves by taking what we have now. And we're giving it to them. That's what we're doing right now. All right. This entire banking system, this, this, this tokenized pseudo reality. This is something that has come out of someplace and it's trying to push us aside so that it can take what we have and actualize itself as the future. And in some cases as God, basically it's trying to displace God, trying to displace the very identity of reality so that it can replace it and be God. Right. That's what we're doing now, you know, I mean, this is an oversimplification. I'm using terms that are as close to to what you're capable of understanding as, you know, I, 
that's a little bit patronizing, but you know, no. I don't know what you're capable of understanding. No. But when I use I'm using religious terms here sure. because those are the closest closest terms to what I'm talking about here. Okay. And tell me this is going to be in the possible book. Futures this better be in the book. Looking to <laughs> that are looking to nucleate the present so they can actualize themselves over time. Right. And unfortunately, we are being displaced by one of them right now. Mankind has a destiny. It would be wonderful if we could get together and, and fulfill it, right? But there's something that doesn't want us to have a destiny. It wants us to die so that it can take what we have and use it for its own future. Right? I see. Okay. And, do you, and do you think and that, th that it is possible? Does that pertain then to the other civilizations that didn't exist? Would that pertain to those? Like if you take like the dinosaurs, uh, the ice age, whatever you want to call you're, you're it. You're talking about uh, you're talking about prior civil. Yes. Yeah. That's that, that's how it works. It's the same cycle. It just goes over and over again. Basically, it's wow. telesis nucleating itself using opportunities that that it encounters in the present, in this world. I get okay. It. All those quantum particles zipping around; those are opportunities. If you make them come together in certain ways, you can actually make physical things happen. Right, and this is what Telesis is doing. It's trying to create a future for itself that is not ours. I get it. Okay, and we have unfortunately been very lax. You've got to guard against this constantly. If you want to keep, you know, the world is a pretty nice place if you make the most of it, right? But we have been very lax. Most people have been saying, "Oh well, we got nothing to worry about. The government will protect us. We'll just leave it all up to them." And meanwhile. <laughs> We'll sit here in front of the uh, TV set and chew pork rinds oh, and drink yeah. beer. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work that. It doesn't work that way. No. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to watch what's happening. The founding fathers of the U.S. knew this. They knew that the government governments always go bad. They always turn bad on you. Okay, they're like parasites waiting to happen. Yeah. All right, and that is what has happened to us now. The government doesn't give a hoot what we think. It doesn't give a hoot what we say. They have the power, and they're using it against us. And we were talking about the uh, the Substack post. You had that Substack post. That's what I'm talking about. That's what this genocide theory is all about. They want to get rid of the people who are alive now so that a whole new breed can come here to live. Right? I this believe. is what we have. That, that's, that's what reality really is. I mean, this is how it takes shape. So this is something that we have to we've got to shape up. We've got to start being more careful about what we allow to have. Now, these people already have so much power, the, the government, the powers that be, already have so much power that we're going to play hell getting it back. Can we get it back? And fulfilling our destiny. I mean, is it even possible to get it back at this point that we've let it go so much? Well, you know, they're, 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 it's, it's a bifurcation. There are two kinds, yeah. two things that could happen. We're either going to head in one of two directions, and one of them is called the tech singularity. You know what that, that is? Yeah. That's a transhumanist. Okay, we're all going to become machines, right? Right. Or and the other one that I talk about is called the human singularity. Right. What we want is a human singularity. A human singularity is like the Omega point that was talked about by Teilhard de Chardin, mm -hmm. right? Who was a Jesuit priest, I think, who talked about you know this that there would be a union between mankind and reality itself that would cause this new leap this great leap forward in human social evolution it was going to wake us all up. It was going to be a mass awakening, and we were going to suddenly realize what it was all about and unify with reality and become consistent with reality so that we could move into the future and fulfill our destiny. That's what the human singularity is. Mm -hmm. We have to make that happen. And the way we do it is we have to understand what reality is, what we are, and how we fit into reality. And if we can do that, then we can have a destiny. But as it is right now, our destiny is being stolen from us by people who want nothing to do with us and have voiced, made it very evident that they have nothing but contempt for us. All right? We have to, we have to stop that debt. We can't let this go on. Right? We can't let Klaus Schwab stand up oh, there and you, you, you will eat the <laughs> bugs. You will be happy. Ugh. You know? Yeah. You will own nothing. Yeah. Okay. We can't allow that to, to occur. I mean, we can't listen to that crap anymore. You know? And you know what, Chris? The only time that we ever have unity like that is a, a drastic situation. 9 11, you know, people came together for a little while. Everybody came together. You know, something major, some something catastrophic. Oftentimes, I'll, those cat catastrophes are caused 
you know, by people who want people to come together in a certain way that works to their advantage. To their advantage. Okay? Some yeah. people say that 9-11 is such an end. I'm not going to, you know, say anything about that right now. Mm -hmm. But I, know, I've had some people in. think that 9-11 was engineered just so they could make people accept the Patriot Act and all mm -hmm. of these, this, you know, huge loss of freedom that we, that we endured after that occurred. But it was entire the whole thing was engineered. Okay, and this has happened time and time again. That's not the kind of catastrophe or coming together event that we need. No. We need something that is driven by knowledge, by goodwill, by logic. And if we can get that, we got it made. Then we got a shot. We got our work cut out for us because it's going to be very, very hard to make that happen. I, uh, real quick, I want Rob to tell uh, Chris about the story about your Mexican friend. You know, we were talking about the border. I just think you'll find this interesting because right. it goes along with what what you were saying earlier. Yeah, so there's this a, is fucking this this one's wild. There's a guy from this episode is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Breaking news: Manscaped now sells beard products. That's right, they are once again revolutionizing men's grooming with brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. From a beard trim to a fresh shave, the technology behind Beard Hedger Pro Kit allows you to shave your signature beard look. Now you can finally use Manscaped products to make your drapes match your carpet by going to manscaped.com and using code MSCS Media for 20% off and free shipping. No one likes a weird beard, so say goodbye to all the stubble trouble with Manscaped's Pro Beard Kit. It all starts with the Beard Hedger. This thing is a monster of fixing faces. First off, this cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard. No more messing around in drawers, this color one, that color one, all with one guard. Plus it's waterproof, so you can shave in the shower and avoid all that hair in the sink. The Pro Kit doesn't end there though. First, there's the beard shampoo and conditioner. You need to remember your hair is different. Next, Manscaped's beard oil. Cap it off with beard balm. The Pro Kit also comes with three different gifts, a beard brush, comb and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress so get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code mscs media at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off and free shipping at manscaped.com use the code mscs media this episode is brought to you by fiji more than just water this is not just rock it's ancient volcanic rock that filters tropical rain giving it double the electrolytes and its signature soft smooth taste it's not just water, it's Fiji water. My hometown, and uh, he came to the country from Mexico over 30, 30 years ago, uh, came illegally, and um, was able to secure, it's either a visa or a green card, I'm not sure which one, you have to re re renew it every so many years. Um, well, he never renewed it. Uh, he was able to build up a few successful businesses, uh, Mexican restaurants and things like that. Paid his taxes because he had a tax identification. Paid taxes for, you know, 20 years, whatever it was, how long he had his business. He gets a deportation notice. His lawyer says, hey, listen, you'll be all right. You got to go back to Mexico. They got to stamp something. You'll be able to come back over. So he went to Mexico and then they're like, oh, cool. Yeah, you can't go back to the United States for ten years. And who said that to him? The I guess the government or whoever is in charge of the Mexican government. No, the United, the States, United government. States government. And so he was like, "All right, shit. Well, my businesses are up there. My family's up there. He's married. He has two kids. And he did come illegally, but he was paying taxes all these years and all this type of stuff. So." You know, I guess it's kind of funny. He's trying to do it legally now. He doesn't want to just cross the border and go back. And they're saying, nope, you're stuck here. But yet thousands upon thousands of people are crossing every day now back. And he was paying taxes and everything. Well, it's totally unvetted. Obviously, that's completely unfair. Yeah. But that's that's the immigration system now. Yeah. It's totally irrational. This is the kind of crap that they pull all the time. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds to me like this guy, I mean, separating him from his wife and kids who've lived here. For many years, they've got businesses. He's a taxpayer. I mean, this is something that uh, it's not easy to justify. And yet, we've got millions <laughs> of people flooding into this country. I mean, they've got they've got people from you know places like Nigeria and China coming up into the U.S. through the southern border. Yeah, and they're letting that happen. Well, meanwhile, they're keeping this guy out of the country. Yeah. Who is it? It's just it's totally irrational. Thirty years. 
Right, right. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, so this guy, this guy sounds to me like a productive citizen who's actually proved himself. Okay, <laughs> and now look what they're pulling on. Okay, yeah. they want they want the dregs, they want the, the, the trash. Yeah. Okay, and the they drugs. don't want guys like that. No, yeah. it's just amazing. I I, I thought and you would really just tells find you that all amazing. About him, doesn't yeah. It? yeah. I mean, that yeah. tells you everything right there, and he knows him personally. The guys are thirty years, business, everything. Yeah. Leaves and then tries to come back the right way, and they tell him ten years. He fit- Meanwhile, he looks over on the corner, and there's the cartel, with, you know, three thousand <laughs> boats coming over, and he's like, "I have five businesses up there in New York, like and paying dur- your ninety percent tax." And during COVID, he fe- <laughs> and during COVID, he fed the first responders, fed the police officers for free, and he also mm-hmm. goes to schools, little you know, uh, elementary schools, and he speaks to kids. Now he's he's like. I don't want to say he's no one. That's a bad thing to say. But he's not like, you know, some face figure like an NBA star or an NFL star. But he goes to these schools. He speaks to kids. And what he teaches all the kids is you can achieve the American dream like I did by working hard. And he teaches the kids at a young age. He does. He, he does all this crazy stuff. And they stuff kick him out. And they kick him out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's that's just insane yeah. it, but it's like i say uh, immigration policy in general is insane mm-hmm. and by the way this guy having five businesses you know if they're worth any money that might have played i mean is there anybody that can reach in there and grab the guy's businesses because yeah you know uh, the government is awfully corrupt these days so if there's you know if there was if there's some form of corruption i don't know where are you from philadelphia pennsylvania yep philly yeah okay yeah yeah, they're they're, cor- they're corrupt. They're, yeah, it's yeah. a special. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, it's correct in that respect. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little so, different. So, so that's definitely in play. You know, yeah. I mean, they may just be out to grab the guy's assets. You know, just like they sent six billion dollars for an accounting error, right? Six billion to Ukraine and was an accounting error. Three billion three months before that. That's nine billion that went somewhere. Oh well, yeah, it was it was uh, two point three trillion. That was that was Donald <laughs> Rumsfeld reported you know oh that genius but yeah. to, the that was the 9 11 thing mm-hmm. okay and then and then they just decided well we made we misled you know six billion <laughs> there was an accounting error that we intended to give Zelensky in ukraine so now we're going to have to take that money and, and give it to him just like he's supposed <laughs> to get but that's that's <laughs> nothing compared to the 21 trillion 21 trillion that just disappeared with a right? t yeah <laughs> with a t with a t i guess that went to defense trillion. right Twenty-one trillion dollars. Just oh well, we don't know where it went. And how many years? Good luck finding out, Chris. And how how many years? We don't know. We don't. How many years did twenty-one trillion take? How many? How many? How many what? How many many years until the twenty-one trillion added up to twenty-one trillion? Oh, I imagine these people can steal twenty-one trillion (laughs) in just a very, very few years. You know, 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 give them five years, they can probably suck out. Well, we we know where to go when we want funding, Chris. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> right? we need well, I don't think they're going to share. I don't think they're going to share. Hey, funding I was trying to go. I was trying to go with the open mind. Uh, you know that we had yeah, earlier yeah, on yeah. with with, with uh, the. Oh, yeah, like they're going to cooperate with us. They're yeah, to do the right thing, right? Right, because you know that would end war, and they couldn't sell bullets anymore, and they couldn't sell machine guns, and that's, put people in jail for everything for now, private now prisons. Yeah, now you got. It. Now, uh, kind of ending on a funny note, tell me about the uh, game show you were on, uh, One Versus 100. Uh, pull up tab seven, I found a clip of. <laughs> the game show, uh, One Versus 100? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> How was that? A joke? Uh, you know, that was uh, that was actually, it was it was okay playing the game. Gina and I agreed before before we, okay, first of all, the, the game show host got in touch. They wrote about half a dozen times. And I kept on saying, no, you know, don't bother. I, I'm not interested. But Gina, you know, kept on telling me, you know, they called again, they called again. So finally, we said, all right, uh, we'll go ahead and, and be on the show. Mm-hmm. They made us wait in a, in a damn trailer. You know those trailers with the stars on the on the doors, you know, yeah. that they, yeah. they give the actors when the actors are on set, right? Uh, they stuck us in one of those for like two or three days. We sat on our asses in there, you know, and they'd bring what? little, you know, plates of, you know, like, you know, muffins and cheese and stuff like that. So that's what we lived on for a couple of days. Then finally, you know, they came and uh, they came and got us one day. And Gina and I had had figured, okay, if we get a chance to get out of there with you know two hundred and fifty thousand, we'll go ahead and check out. We'll just go ahead and burn up all my 
lifelines and we'll take the uh, take the 250. So that's the way we played it. And it was a good thing because, you know, after uh, we found out what the next question was going to be, and uh, damn me if I knew the answer to it, you know. So you know, I did the right thing. He won the 250. Uh, won the 250. You should have went back again for another 250. Well, it was I was actually playing for the Mega Foundation, so the the, the building is simply it was in disrepair. It was a it was a it used to be the it's the original power station in North Missouri. We're in North Central Missouri here, and this is the power station. It's a nice brick building. You see it from the outside, you think, well, that's a nice building. You go inside. It was a luxury restaurant, uh, and basically what it was was after they got the generators out of there and stopped being a power station, they made a restaurant, luxury restaurant out of it for the purpose of whining and dining and dining investors. For a new meat packing facility oh boy. that a couple of guys from Kansas City wanted to set up. And it was called Premium Standard. Now it's called Smithfield Farms, I think. Oh, boy. We heard all but, about uh, them. Smithfield uh, Farms. You want a story we're, we're about China them? China owns Smithfield Farms. Yeah, they're yes. cloning. Yeah. I got to tell you this real quick. We There's a very high-end uh, steakhouse here. It's a uh, 90-year tradition. Yeah. He Smithfield got bought out by China and all these other places that sell to Ruth Chris, and they're taking the steak, cloning it, and sending it back. Now the same guy's in Florida here. He he won't lie. He's old guy. This is tradition after tradition. He's got a line at his steakhouse. Like Jay Leno goes there. Everybody. He opens up a fish place. He can't get fish in Florida because China came in. Bought it all up, they clone it, and you get the three for one. And this isn't a bullshitter. This is a, you know, Rob, tell him about. Hey, he's, he's Ralph's, Ralph's yeah. uh, three, well, generations, they own, three generations. Red China owns half of this county. Fucking so, crazy. I, I mean, I, you know, I don't, who the hell is going to sell American property to Red China? I mean, it that sounds like it sounds like national suicide. <laughs> The fact of the matter is they're just <laughs> selling us out. I mean, you know, right? if they can make a little bit of money off us. To hell with us. That's yeah. what they're doing. It's okay. I mean, it's just they're like rats. You know? Yeah, they're everywhere. And, and, yeah, rats who sunk the ship and now they're deserting the ship that they sunk. You know what I'm saying? It's disgusting. I mean, I'd like to wring their necks. But what are you gonna do about them? I mean, try to get past their private security. Never gonna right? happen. Yeah, never gonna happen. Then they found right? forty cops dressed as cops. Forty. But they were China. No visa, no green card, no nothing. They were Actual New York cops. And that was from Ye Ye Nomi Park, who fought her way here from North Korea through hell. And when she realized that, right, mm -hmm. she got out. Like, these cops were cops in New York, but they were Chinese, China intelligence. Took them nine months to catch them. Red Chinese intelligence? Yeah. Cops in New York. You could look it up. You might have to look it up on Brave. Well, that's about right. That's, that's why I finally had to get out of New York after living there for 25 years. Oh, yeah, enough of that. I mean, huh? I couldn't stand it anymore. Nah, the, I... the government there is so corrupt. The state government, you know? I mean, you look at the people that are in charge now, that Kathy Hochul chick. Oh. I mean, woo, she's bad. <laughs> you know? I mean, and, you know, Chucky Schumer and the rest of those guys. I mean, holy cow, man. I, I just couldn't stand it. It was so corrupt, down right down to the local level, you know? And... One of the worst things about it was you couldn't pull out of your driveway, but there would be a cop. And they had so many cops in New York following people around trying to squeeze money out of them, squeeze yeah. revenue out of them for their bosses, the banksters. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. And just, it was enough to make you puke. You know, you couldn't get in your car and drive down to the grocery store without this cop behind you looking to see if you've got a busted tail light or maybe you forgot to renew your driver's license, you know, something yeah. like that. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, we just couldn't stay there anymore. So, so that's uh, that's the kind of now cops. They're another problem. Imagine what would happen. OK, we can't. The government is totally unanswerable to us right now. We can't make them do anything. They got all the power. They're laughing at us. Right. I mean, you got Nancy Pelosi, you know, doing one of these deals at us yeah. and uh, all the rest of them doing exactly the same thing. She's got great stock predictions, by the way. Yeah. She has some hell. Yeah. Her predictions in yeah, stocks are unbelievable. No, yeah. And I, she doesn't get any tips either. I mean, those come right off the yeah. cuff. Right, right, she's just a financial she's genius. She's pulling them out of the sky. She might be yeah. higher than you, Chris. <laughs> she, <laughs> she might break her. She might break her. I mean, hey, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no doubt. No doubt. But yeah, you were talking about New York, and how, how shitty it got. Right, right, right. Yeah, I was, I was uh, talking about New York and uh, why the hell I had to get out. Uh, we simply couldn't stay there anymore because of uh, because of the way it was 
the way it was working. And these, I was also going to mention that that we have a problem with police these days. You know, I, now I used to be a bar bouncer and I'd run security crews and I would hire cops. Cops moonlight oftentimes on security crews. So you hire these guys, you bring them in. So, you know, I'm, I knew a lot of cops and, you know, some of these guys I like, they're decent guys. Um, but that was 20, 30 years ago. Okay. Um, now we got a problem. I, just ask yourself, we can't get to the government to actually shape them up anymore. You know, everybody says, well, if the founding fathers were still here, then all those people would be hanging from lampposts. What we really need to do is go in there and drag them out of their, their offices and, you know, drag them out in the street and, you know, strip them naked and drive them down to the city dump and then lock them in there, right? We can't do that. Okay, you saw what happened on January 6th. You had a bunch of people who, you know, there was a there was an American election, presidential election, that looked like it was stolen. So a lot of people went down there. And the, some of those people, I think, are still in the dungeons. Yeah. They're in. They put them in, in solitary DC. confinement. We had the lawyer right. for a couple of them in, and the shit right. he was telling me that they were doing to them, taking away their medical needs, putting them on right. solitary confinement, basically baiting them, whether you like them or not. And right. Those and, are the D.C. Capitol <clears throat> Police, by the correct. way. Correct. Those, those are the Capitol Police mm -hmm. that are doing that. And this okay. is what I'm talking about. Basically, if we imagine what would happen if we subtracted the police, if we got rid of every cop in the United States. Now, one thing that would happen is social chaos. OK, the criminals would go hog, which they're doing now anyway. Right. But but, you know, basically it would be really bad if you got rid of all the cops. OK, but the thing is, I mean, we already have I mean, basically the cops, their hands have been tied so they can't go after the criminals. anymore. Instead, they go after law abiding people. Right. Um, and the second thing that would happen is we'd be able to go to Washington, D.C. and drag those people out of their offices and take them outside and hold a people's tribunal and say, people are a bunch of thieves. OK, so you don't have a job anymore. You go and learn how to operate a broom or a mop and we're going to put somebody decent in your office now. Right. We would be able to do that if it weren't for the cops. The cops are standing between us and actually fixing the government. Why? Because a cop is a mercenary. He'll take money from anybody who will, you know, sign the check for him, right? Even if the money in that check has been stolen from the American people, nevertheless, he's loyal to the people that sign the check. Okay? And so that's that's what our problem is. Basically, the police, they're a two-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, they, they, they stabilize society when they're allowed to do their jobs. When they're not allowed to do their jobs, they become nothing but a liability. And that's what we have now. I mean, the only thing stopping us is what stopped the January 6th protesters from retaining their freedom. That you see true. what I mean? Yeah. Which is the police. Police just go out, you know, round them up, you know, do whatever they want to with them. And there's not a thing that we can do about it. But what's funny is, Chris, the B, L, J, Q, B, C, whatever letter they're at now, they do 10 LGBTQ. times more. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what letters we're at now. I just know we were at B something and... Now I don't know. B blah blah yeah, blah blah. Trans. Q, which is questioning. <laughs> yeah. you're, trying to figure, you're trying to figure your gender out. Yeah, you know? yeah. That that's where that that. You don't know in. what your pronouns are yet. Yeah. Now we have three bathrooms while China is just getting stronger and everybody else. But you have those. But when they do that, it seems to not be that big a deal. You know, let's go knock down statues, whatever. Not really a big deal. But this January 6th thing, you got guys in solitary confinement, not getting treated, everything else is the end of the world because the BQ thing was with the agenda. The January 6th thing was not with the agenda. So therefore, the, the results are, are contradicting. And then if you do right, have right. that handful of cops that actually want to do their nine to five, they're fucked anyway because if, they, if they're white and go after a black person, they're done. Their family's done for. If it's the opposite, you run the risk of that. So even if you want it to be a good cop, how? Right. And that's why we have cultural Marxism. I mean, that's what basically the cops are enforcing it. You know, the, the, the elite are telling them, okay, we're going to have some cultural Marxism here. And if you want to keep your job, you're going to get with the program. And, you know, if you don't want to get with the program, beat it. Okay. So all the cops that are there now are willing to enforce you know, to cram cultural Marxism down everyone else's throat. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, that's selling out, you know, the people of the United States. And so, you're talking you, about when, the when lowest oh, level. What the hell do you do with these guys? Now, I'm sure there's some good cops who would like to stand up and say, you know, 
come on, we got to, we got to improve. We got to do something, you know, like oath keepers and things like that. We got to keep our oaths, you know, and try to do the right thing here. Most of them, unfortunately, I think they've been, you know, they, they, they very much favor minorities now as police and the reason they favor minorities is because minorities have been trained to hate whitey so sure. when they hire a lot of minority officers it's easier for them to go out and and abuse the u.s majority which is really what they're concerned about mold them and into what, what they want precisely that's why they're always running us down as uh white supremacist domestic terrorists and that kind of thing and that's at the bottom level. Then you have the corrupt FBI, you have the corrupt CIA, you have the corrupt Senate, and then they act like they don't like each other, but they're all having wine together that evening, I'm sure. You know what I mean? Then you oh, have, yeah. It's a, it just it's goes all the way club. up the line to the top. It's a big club. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I've, I've, I've conversed with people that are in the CIA, uh, you know, uh, as far as the FBI is concerned, I've only met a couple of those people. They were totally corrupt. I mean, totally. Um, you know, the DHS, that shouldn't even be called an American agency. It's actually more of a foreign agency that was brought in here after 9-11. You know, George Bush Jr. brought that in here. Um, you know, uh, the CIA, I don't know. I'm sure he's still out on it in a way, but I've watched them do too much. Too much bad stuff over the last few years. We've had in three or four that got to the top. They were the head, <clears throat> and they ended up resigning. And it's funny. The, these three or four older gentlemen, one's a real – he's like the legend, Rick Prado. But they resigned. They didn't like what was going on, and they formed their own little thing to go after little girls that were stolen. Uh, and that's what they did because – I mean, I don't want to put words into their mouth, but I think it got to a point where – the CIA uppers, they would report back, hey, look, these little girls look odd. There's something going on over here. We want to go check this out. No, leave that alone and go over there. And these men, they just couldn't live with that. And all four of them at the top resigned. And then they created their own thing, and they go and find those little girls. But they couldn't. Whatever and they nobody's did, nobody's interfering with them when they try to find. Oh yeah, they're fucking yeah, they're yeah, they have to hide out where their places. Yeah, it, it, ex exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, it almost seems sometimes that the government wants this problem to continue with the little kids disappearing, and God only knows what they're doing with them. I mean, it's it's well, because it, that's it what kind of brings tears to your eyes when you consider how many of these kids are disappearing every year. And that's what had happened. These guys would go to multiple countries and constantly see the same thing. Say like. A little girl with a green jacket. Then they go to another country. Another little girl with a green jacket. Piles of them. And they just couldn't. Within. Within. They just couldn't deal with it anymore. Because they kept calling mm -hmm. it. Let it go. Let it go. And they couldn't. Right? Rob. Mm -hmm. And they just could. They just straight up walked in one day. I'm done. It's over. I don't care. Keep my pension. Keep my retirement. I can't do this anymore. This is wild. You know. The other shit. You want me to cut up somebody with a knife. Because they did whatever. Okay. Fine. But you're forgetting about these little kids over here. You know, just wild. It's just wild. Uh, uh, it's a, a Jim Caviezel movie out about uh, about uh, the child, there, kid, there, uh, the human trafficking <clears throat> problem. There, there is a new the one that what's the movie they they keep Thousand, talking? Uh, oh God, hold on. The the one that they keep talking about. Well, the guys that Sound I, of Freedom. Sound of Freedom. The guys that I've had in, they had interviewed them for that movie, and they're mad as hell. Because they felt like they put a cushion on that. Like they took out the the adrenaline part. The main thing. Where they have those kids over there to get that adrenaline out of them. You know? Adrenochrome. Adrenochrome. Uh, adrenochrome. They took that out of the movie. They, they, they took out a lot of the, the vicious things that are happening out of the movie to make it PG-13. And they're, they're very... They're suing them. They kind of neutered the, the, the movie. Right. Because you want to... If you want to do this movie and you want to interview me, I'm telling you what's happening over here. I'm only listening. I'm only sitting here with you because I want you to get this out. And then you cut it down to like some baby movie that PG-13. Listen, it's not PG-13 over there in those countries with those little girls and mm. boys, you know? Uh, that's It's like I say, Hollywood is pretty much overrun by, by CIA agents now. And I, I think they're basically just on the government tit and they don't care about anything else. You know, um, 
one would think that they'd be a little bit concerned with public relations at this point. <laughs> but I don't think they are. I mean, you, there's nothing you could do about it. Like this, you see, it's fucking nuts. And, and that's what I and that's what I mean. If you go, go out and try to do anything about it. You got Johnny Law you know, yeah. to cope with, and, and the know, thing is, you're not kidding. Law is go- huh? And you're not kidding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's serious. Yeah. But you yeah. know, basic, basic, basically, it's it's uh, it's a tyranny of evil. It looks like. And ju- and just to further your point, and then one more thing: we've had seven guys in here, and they testified against the Senate, speaking out like you, trying to make things better. I know now. When somebody comes in, and hopefully I, I get the chance to meet you in person one day, when they don't open a bottle of water after an hour of talking, mm-hmm. I know they tried to kill him. And within that two or three hours, they'll bring up, oh, yeah, they tried to kill me. Every single time. Seven different guys that came in, either CIA agent or just somebody who testified with the, the Senate, they all re- legitimately, they tried to kill him. And one of the guys, an innocent guy, they killed his wife. Instead of him, mother of five. And it was uh, Dr. Epstein, a nice, nice guy. We're three and a half hours in, and he's like, yep, yeah, they killed my wife. And I'm like, wait a minute. You're the top whatever he is in, in the planet. You testified based on technology. You're a Democrat, but you testified to the Senate that Google was suppressing with all the data and the proof in the planet that Google was suppressing for this last election. And because of that, they, they killed your wife. Well, as he's walking, because he had all the evidence in the world, Chris. I mean, this is, you know, he's up there, you know. Yeah. So he walks out. Lindsey Graham goes up to him and says, you know, they're going to kill you. Now, he brushes it off like, I'm just a computer nerd that reads data all day long. Well, two weeks later, he asks his wife to go get milk. Car spins out of control. Wife passes away. No it's like car- a brake job. Well, the car can't be... The car's nowhere to be found. Nine oh, mo- really? Yeah. Car disappears. I love the way the evidence always disappears. Isn't it? But they fucked, with the wrong- <laughs> they fucked with the wrong guy because this guy could tap into the satellites. When you're on the turnpike and you go past the green things, they got cameras in. He could tap into all of them. Nine mm-hmm. mo- Make a long story short. Nine months later, he finds his wife of five kids, the car, burnt to shreds in Mexico. Whew. Well, that's something. Now, come on, a father of five now, but with no mother, because the guy testified that you and proved that you were suppressing shit. I mean, that's how crazy this is. Just to further your point. Well, you know, it's organized crime. Tom. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what we're down to. Yeah, that's what that's what that's what U.S. you know governance is now, organized crime. So what well, might as well, you know might as well be the mafia. I mean, you know. Well, they the they killed the mafia. I, I yeah. was in South Philly. This th- well, shit, well, the the shit I saw was nothing. Oh, holy hell. I mean, Jesus Christ. We just My friends just tried to get a couple of dollars on a piece of fruit or a pizza, a slice of pizza. This is some crazy shit here. So everything, i kind of been silent today. I've just taken a lot in here. Um, so if I get this correct, you're, we are talking about the interface earlier. And... Uh, we talked, you know, we're talking about the interface and you compared a lot of things to religion, not saying, you know, that's it, but just so people could understand uh, through a religious perspective with, with things, God and things like that. So are you saying that we're here, we're, we're, we're living in an interface and when we perish, I, I remember this part, we go back to home base, right? So we go back to base and then we're spit back out and that could be in any form of anything. Like I know this sounds crazy, but like you die, boom, you go up and then you spit back out and you come back as a dog or no, is that totally wrong? Am I misunderstanding it? Well, if you ask a Hindu, (laughs) they're going to tell you that that makes sense, but uh, there has to be a rhyme and a reason. Okay. In other words, you're not going to get, it's got to be something that is con- the identity of reality is constantly refining itself. It wants to make things better. It wants to optimize, to improve. Okay, that's the whole point oh, okay. of existence. It wants to identify itself and and to better and better resolution. Okay, so if you actually are a worthwhile person that can be used, your life force can be used in a better way 
than being reincarnated as somebody's pet pooch, mm. then that is more likely to happen to you than uh, than uh, being reincarnated as a dog. Got you. Okay. And and then for so if you're on this earth and you complete the earthly mission of being a good person, let's say you've 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 lived your life, you've made mistakes, but you've lived your life as a good person. You leave you were good, you leave, do you have to come back or do you just stay away? You, you've already done the mission. In the CTMU, God is our highest level of identity. We all share this top level of identity, which is God. Our own top level of identity is what makes the decision about whether we come back and as to what we come back. Okay? okay. It's God, but it's also our own highest level of identity. Now, what you have to keep in mind is this this morphism that uh, along which you are retracted, that can be impaired or damaged. We talked about serial killers before yep. as an example of people who damage that meomorphic connection with the identity. Okay? Some people cut it. You know, in the Bible, they talk about, uh, you know, blasphemy being, blaspheming the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit being the unforgivable sin. Right? That's because by by denying God to God's face, denying the identity to its face, you are literally denying reality. And when you deny reality, you're also denying this retraction mechanism. Reality is what's retracting you and what is enabling you to survive after death. So if you're denying the structure of reality, including the identity, which is the G-O-D, this is going to cost you because it's going to sever okay. that morphism. Okay? Now you're going to be isolated. You're going to be trapped. And the bad thing about that is God sees you through that morphism. So when you cut it and when you sever it, God can't see you anymore. And mm -hmm. when God can't see you, you are truly exist. isolated. Mm -hmm. How do you get his attention again? How do you get the intention, the attention of the identity once you've totally cut it like that? This is what, you know, this is what I tell atheists. You know, you don't want to get carried away. You don't want to do a Richie Dawkins thing, you know, where you're just <laughs> spitting in God's face all the time. Yeah, right. Not a good, for, 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 not, not a good idea, just in case. <laughs> right, right. That's 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 a very very bad idea to do that, and that's the reason you want God to at least be able to see you, so that if you plead for mercy and say, "I'm going to turn over a new leaf," I need to be forgiven, that God will actually hear that plea. Okay, but people that have that are very effective at praying. You know, that can use the law of attraction, you know, in, to their advantage. Those are the people that have connect, kept that connection alive and well and intact. Okay? You want to make sure that you do that. Otherwise, you don't have a chance. And so, like I said, that's what I'm constantly telling these, these atheists. They think it's cool, you know. They're taking a big, big chance. And it's going to come back and bite them. I don't, I don't take those chances just in case I'm completely wrong. The law of attraction thing. I always, <clears throat> when I come across one of these law of attraction things, right away I'm like, I think snake. Well, what what are you up to? Right right away, that's just my stigma. They come with this law of attraction thing and speak to the universe, and that's going to bring me a gold pot. And yeah, that's not actually how it works. Right, I mean, but that's how they act. Are... So right yeah. when I hear that, I, I you know, because I've hired some of them and I'm like, OK, you're going to last about a year before your representative coat comes off. <laughs> but what you have to say right now is is good enough. But in my mind, I, I know who you are, pal. So what's your thoughts on the real law of attraction? Not not the the pansy uh, make money well, off of it. Thing. It's just how causation actually works. Causation. actually. Um, works. A lot of people think yeah. believe they believe in physical causation. Right. Physical causation is not possible because it works in a fixed array. And I've already said there is no fixed array. Right. The array has to be generated. Okay, so there's a new kind of causation that has to be invoked. It's called metacausation or telic recursion. That's how the law of attraction works. All right. And it's not, you know, it has nothing to do with, you know, imagine a big gold Cadillac, you know, <laughs> and uh, how are we going to get our hands on that? You know, just, you know, that's not the way it works. Okay. So, you know, you just have to, there, there is a, a kind of almost a mechanics to it. And that will keep you on the right side of the identity, by the way. Okay. Uh, the, the thing about the law of attraction is it always works. That's the way causation works. Basically, you've got attractors. You've got telic attractors that actually 
attract causation into themselves, but it can take a long, long time. People tell you, tell you th this works overnight, that you're going to get instant results. That's that's a con job, okay? Uh, it doesn't. You've got to stick with it, and you've got to keep on, and you've got to act in such a way as to help bring it about. Okay, in other words, telic recursion works mainly through us. We're its engines. So we have to exercise discipline in the way we go about realizing. And you know, as long as we do that, then we can use the law of attraction. But if we don't, if we're naive about it and say, oh, well, you know, we're just going to, all we have to do is wish for something and it's going to come to us, that's uh, that's an oversimplification to say the least. So when somebody says, uh, I'm going to speak into the universe that I'm going to get a Ferrari. Okay, if you speak into the universe, I'm going to get a Ferrari, I'm going to get a Ferrari. Then you go out and you come up with an invention or you work three jobs a day, da, da, da. Then that works. But if you just go and say, Rob's going to get a Ferrari, Rob's going to get a Ferrari, Rob's going to get a Ferrari, you're going to be waiting a long time. But yeah, yeah. And of course, you, you can realize that's, that's total nonsense because however causation works, okay, you have to have okay. something that will work for everybody. If everybody says, I want a Ferrari... <laughs> They don't manufacture that many Ferraris, you know right. what I mean? So that can't possibly work. It can't. It can't work that way. That's where um, I'm yeah. saying. That's where I'm making the connection where you said with the physical. So you can have the law of attraction where you speak something into existence, but the physical part also has to go along with it. You know, that's exactly right. Otherwise, it's just useless bullshit. Right. It takes a very great deal of discipline, and sometimes you got to work years and years, and it really does take effort. But that effort is all part of that, the how things are attract, how you attract a future to yourself. I okay, see. we all do it through effort. We're always we're all trying to create the futures we want. Okay, so we have to make that future attract us. And that means we do the right things to get there. Right. Now, what do we do when uh, Michelle Obama decides to run and wins? <laughs> uh, you think, know that's 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 like some kind of nightmare isn't it i i i, uh, I, okay. I know it's I, a nightmare but i really think man i've been looking and reading i don't know she did a book with oprah like she's following the same lines of yeah, there, there's some people who think she's running things she and barry are running things right now well i i don't that, doubt that either that joe's kind of like there you know well he's definitely oh. not thinking <laughs> I mean, that's not in joe's repertoire no and, and whatever they were shooting him up with uh i think he's built a tolerance too so i mean the shot's worn out he's worn out but uh yeah. i i think yeah. she's gonna run you don't think so well they're gonna have to obviously get rid of kamala well, that's to make hard. room to make room for michelle and uh who else might run what about rfk jr i mean rfk jr is also making noise like he's gonna try for a a Democratic nomination, but you know, they just did something rotten to him. He, they denied him Secret Service protection, yeah. So he can't even, he, he they can't deny him some... Secret Service wow. protection, yeah. Jeez. DOJ denied him Secret Service protection, wow. And I mean, that's and after two members of the Kennedy family were murdered yeah. during, you know, either during while serving or during a campaign. That's pretty bad. We've been talking to his people left and right, too. Wow. Because he's down yeah. here in Miami, uh, RFK. I, I like him. I think he's a reasonable guy. You know, I think he's... Yeah, he's a reasonable guy. Yeah, I, I very much like his approach to vaccines. He tells he tells the truth. He tells yeah. it as he sees it. There's some things, you know, like, you know, some of his positions in the past regarding uh, the Second Amendment, for example, and immigration. He, you know, he's actually put out statements more recently that tend to make him look a little bit better in those regards. But trusting politicians is something I don't usually do, no matter who they are. No, that's true. <laughs> Probably I, a good idea. A good idea. You know, you know. I mean, yeah. I I spoke up for Donald Trump a few years back. Uh, you know, discussing people asking, well, how smart do you think he really is? You know, with what you know about intelligence testing and so forth. And I I said he's probably as smart as the average Harvard professor. Yeah. Okay. In other words, if you were walking down the hall, hall in Harvard and Donald Trump was teaching an economics course or a business management course, would you walk in there and say, you sure as hell would, okay? He's he's at, he's at least as smart as the average guy there. Um, so, yeah, but then Donald turned around and, you know, he did some things that, that sort of upset me, you know. He still may be the best person out there for the job, um, but he has some answering to do for certain things that went down during his presidency that he really should have allowed for. 
Yeah. They should, they should have been treated a little bit better. You know, live and learn. Um, but you like know, you I, said, I, you weigh it out. You got a guy, like I'd like to ask him, but see, I, I would need to do so much preparation to sit across from him because he would just twist. You know, like I would have to research him for six months. But I would like to ask him, your war on drugs. Okay, why did you make every single pharmacy get this certain ID scanner? Where's Jared Kushner? Where's he at? Yeah. Where's Ivanka? And they're nine hundred million from the vaccine. Lap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, uh, where'd that nine hundred million from the vaccine? You mean to tell me, Donald, that you didn't know that everybody around you was a snake? Everybody was a snake. Not you didn't realize that one wasn't. And you really are sitting here today, and you don't know that your lawyers are on the take. Like I'm just a little South Philly guy, and I know that they're on the take. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's again, right? You know that. Basically, anybody who gets anywhere in national politics has got to play along to a certain extent. Yeah. So some of it is is acting, you know, as it is with any other politician. They're actors. Didn't they get uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez? Wasn't she responding <laughs> to an to a want ad for an actress? I mean, yeah, that's what's what I heard anyway. Is that true? I don't know about I, that. I don't doubt it. I, I, every time I see her, I laugh, and I just I don't even I won't even put my personal time into reading what what just idiotacy that woman's doing. Yeah. Well, anyway, with, the, with in the case of uh, Donald Trump, I was a little bit upset, you know, with the Operation Warp Speed yeah. routine uh, because it was obvious to me that the vaccines weren't safety tested. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they were tested for efficacy. I, they're totally worthless and they're worse than nothing. So I think that Donald needs to explain what the heck he was thinking with that. I think he needs to explain what the hell he was do, doing, being as he set out to you know, clear the swamp. I think he needs to explain why he actually hired swamp creatures and put them in his cabinet. Okay. And he might have been for it. His arm might have been twisted. I mean, it's all give and take. You got to, you know, if you want this, then you got to do, do that. You know, yeah. you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I understand that's the way it works. And uh, then the... The fact that he kind of left the the January 6th people swinging in the breeze, which, you know, it's little things like I, they're not so little, actually. But there are things like these that I think uh, we need to hear a little bit more about. We need to hear an explanation for, for why those things went wrong. Right. Because, you know, whoever we put in there, they, they got to do something. I mean, they've got to. They got to do something about these problems, and if you're just going to go along with them, you know, and then and then blow pixie dust up everybody's ass about it, you know, to to make them feel good, that's no good. We need more than that, though, right? I don't care how many people you can draw to a rally, you need to actually do something. And if you're unable to do something, then just admit it, you know. And like I said earlier, I don't understand other than <laughs> Kushner being involved and his daughter. I, I guess that's why. I guess. Why Why would you not come up? Why would you not say anything about Operation War Speed? You had five different other vaccines to pick. Why? Well, you know, he dotes, on, he dotes on his daughter. I mean, she's a daddy's girl, right? Yeah. And, I mean, he, he'll, he'll do anything for his daughter. It looks to me like, you know, she's got daddy wrapped around her little finger. Um, Jared Kushner, his entire financial future depends on, you know, certain loans that he are outstanding. And uh, I'm sure that Donald Trump doesn't want to see jared you know get uh get foreclosed on because that would more or less have an effect on him on Ivanka and on his him. grandchildren yeah. yeah precisely so so you know i mean this is something you know i mean they they want to get something on every politician you know if i was you know if i was to run for president i would immediately suspect that okay well you know <laughs> they're going to try to get something <laughs> on you right away you know yeah. And uh, they're going to go back. They're going to, you know, vet everybody you've ever known. In my case, that would be hard for them. So I've, you know, been a lot of places. Don't know for sure that, you know, a lot of people remember me in any particular place. In New York, probably a lot of them do. But, um, you know, I live kind of clean. So there's not much they could really have. on, Right. But uh, most people, even if they don't have something, even if they can't find anything on you in the past, they will create something. Create something. Okay? Yeah. You're about to, to meet the best looking broad in the world, you know, and she's just going to not going to be able to get enough of you. And, so, and right? some of them you're like, I, yeah. I wish that really did happen. <laughs> well, like, like, like Swalwell, you know, and, yeah. and his Chinese spy girlfriend, right? I yeah. mean, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. 
So how how important is this election to our few? Like if they if another Biden ish gets in or Michelle gets in, are we doomed? If Trump somehow does escape, probably seven indictments by the time it comes and gets in, or Kennedy maybe. I don't see how Kennedy. I think they'll just push him out. Um, well, it's, it's like I say, government is they're going to cheat. They're organized crime now. So this election will be corrupt as well. So it I mean, will be Democrat. Right. It will probably be a Democrat unless the people show some spine, show some backbone, get out there in the streets and actually, you know, make a little noise. Um, and uh, and if they have to take you know, I hate to say this, you know. I don't want violence in the streets, and I certainly don't want to advise anybody to to you know resist the police. On the other hand, if the police are going to try to you know subject it, if they're going to usher in tyranny, you know, then it's going to have to be over our dead bodies. It'll be over my dead body. I'm not going to sit still for them. And, and I... other people have to. They've got to have the same the same attitude. I mean, it's got to be you know. Okay, you're going to have to take a little risk here. You're going to have to you know actually stand up and stick your neck out even if it means somebody might chop it off. I mean, you got to be willing to take a risk. These people are going for broke. I mean, they're, they're not going to stop. And I think right? that, I think this is reality, Chris, and whether it happens in a year or three years, it's going to happen sooner or later because there are going to be that that group of people that crack at some and, point. And, and, <clears throat> uh, exactly. And, and, you know, it's very important that they do because as long as the government doesn't see any real resistance from the populace, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Well, they're, you know win they're, I mean? they're winning with that social media. They were just brainwashing you with that TikTok and the news and uh, coming out with another platform to get you with a three-second tension span. And then, oh, there's UFOs and there's this and there's that just to keep, keep distractions distraction yeah. constantly. And this generation, you know, they just don't have it. They don't have it. It's, it's the yeah. old, the old it, it, school it's, guys. It's yeah, it's extremely insulting. You know, guys that are my age, even guys that are your age, you know, uh, it was people were better. It seems like they were of better quality back in the day. You know, I mean, they they would there was a certain line. You could push them so far, then you weren't going to be able to push them any farther. Yeah, you got punched in the you face. Know, these yeah. days, these days, these kids that are coming out of college, it seems like, you know, they're a bunch of little gluttons for punishment. You know, they just they they'll never stand up for themselves. Well. That you know, unless it's for their uh, for their blue haired boyfriend or something. I mean, That's I don't know. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, unless uh, unless they're a trans or whatever, something off the grid. Right. That, that, a, that a member of some yeah fashion cult. protected group, some type a, of cult, a protected community. <clears throat> I right. call it a cult. Unless they're with a cult, then they just got trophies all their life for everything they did and told how great they were, and that's a bully. You know, when I was growing up, I'm sure when you, Rob, you got you had a problem with somebody, you know, bully. I never even heard that word bully. Mm -hmm. What I the, the bully I know is my grandpa. <laughs> that if I got beat up worse than the other guy, I got beat up again. That's the bully <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's right, yeah. If the other guy if I look better have, than the other I guy, the same, I, I, have, I got McDonald's. I have the same memory. I have the same memory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So your yeah. so your prediction in twenty four is it's going to probably be a Democrat. Your book, you better get out before then. You better get that moving before then, and we pump it to hell. Yeah, I better get moving. Better get moving. And look yeah. into look into that a flu top, Chris. And whenever you have time, if you could fly out, it'd be a lot better. If you don't want to fly, then we'll do another Zoom. But well, why you're not? in Florida. We'll yeah, you, Palm Beach, yeah. Florida. So Miami's maybe. I was in I was yeah. in Palm Beach once. I went to Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, right we're five minutes from Mar-a-Lago. Five minutes. Right. Wow. Yeah. So you can you can hit two. You could go say hi to Donald if he's not <laughs> locked. If he's not locked I, I up. I only met him once down there. Um, but you know, and that was years and years. I probably wouldn't even remember who I was. Well, he might need somebody like you on his team if he happened to. to uh, I think you know these these guys. <laughs> that, none of them are. The, the, if you're not above a certain level of intelligence yourself, you're not going to be able to choose someone who is. You're not going to recognize. Him. Yeah. I don't know if I don't know if Donald would know me from Adam. You know what I'm saying? He's got all kinds of people around him. Once you get to a position of power, you've got all kinds of people around you pretending to be smart. The representative. Right? The representative. Could, yes, representing their, their their own intelligence, and uh, and he's probably surrounded by people who he already thinks are the smartest people in the room. 
I got news for them. <laughs> They're not. But, uh, you know, we've seen that already. But uh, nevertheless, I'll, it is what it I'll is. send you something. A very, very close friend of mine went to talk to him, a guy that you would normally listen to, and he didn't listen to a word he said about his lawyers or anything. Three months later, you see what the lawyers were doing. And you know, I, I knew I knew the Trump's personal account. Well, I, I knew a friend, a, an accountant, a professional accountant who was friends with the Trump family accountant. So, you know, I'm, the Trump family is uh, Donald Trump has been a, essentially a billionaire since he was a kid. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing self there's nothing self made about right. Donald Trump. Again, okay? his family, you know, was you know, they were they were they had you know. Millions and millions of dollars worth of rental properties. They were worth, in 1980, they were worth, according to the guy that I knew, they were worth a quarter of a billion dollars. Quarter of a billion. Now, in today's money, that's billions. Yeah. Okay? All right? So this is how much money Donald Trump grew up with. You know, he's truly a spoiled rich kid. And when a kid grows up, you know, like Donald did, in this bubble of wealth and privilege, you know, he gets a very skewed picture of reality. He doesn't understand reality for what it is, uh, you know, to the man on the street. He thinks that it's, you know, having plenty and, you know, and if you don't have rich, if you're not rich like me, you're a loser and that kind of thing. This is something that, you know, uh, I think has, has like worked against Donald over the years. Well, right? But he, he should definitely know what the hell the score is because... He's, you know, in construction in New York. You know who runs construction in New York, right? Yeah. He's been dealing with mafiosi all this I'm aware. Okay. Yeah. All, all, yeah. Uh, all his life. These are the guys he's known. He knows, you know, what life is like on the street. You know, I mean, he's been down there. He's looked at it. So, you know, it better all come back to him. It well, better come well, back to him If quick. one of them right? went to talk to you, wouldn't you probably listen to them? Well, I worked in the bar business in New York, so I... Met a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, if yeah. one of them takes the time, a big one, and goes and talks to you and says, look, use my lawyer, and you say, no, I'm good with my lawyer, and he says, no, 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 you really need to use my lawyer because my lawyer can't be on the take because if he's on the take, he no longer exists <laughs> because then everybody else thinks he's on the take. Right. So you need exactly. to use my lawyer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would listen. You would listen to a guy, right? Because that lawyer is not going to be on the take because he wants to wake up tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, it's just fact. You know, you I know. remember I threw the wrong guy out of a bar once, and I had to lay low for like a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh yeah, to hit the mattresses until the heat got hauled until, until somebody was able to talk to the, the wise guy in question and uh, like take the heat off. Yeah. C C back memories. Chris IQ had to he had to hit the mattresses. He, had, he had to, I don't know if you guys heard that he had, in New York. Well, up in Phil, when I, whenever there was heat coming, they'd always say, "Hey, we'll see you in a month. We got to hit the mattresses." I said, "Oh shit, the feds are coming." Yeah, they, they they say that's because you know back in Italy in the old days, uh, they used to shoot cannonballs at each other with the castles. And they developed this technique of hanging the mattresses outside the windows and on the castle walls so that the cannonballs would hit the mattresses. And amazingly, this protected the stone walls underneath. At least that's the story I heard. Well, now nowadays at the shooting range, every Italian guy I know that goes to the shooting range can't hit anything. <laughs> so so they, they would have used that cannonball and blew up the whole country nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> they can't hit it. If you put an arrow the size of, of China in front of them, they'd miss it. <laughs> but uh... probably yeah probably. <laughs> but, but most of the mafia guys i knew back then have gone straight yeah that was always the idea you know get in make your money but get in make money <laughs> and then once you get enough to go straight you know so that your money now gravitates like a black hole then you do that yeah you no know? yeah but giuliani was, ruined those all were that. the smart mobsters huh yeah giuliani ruined that and then god he just put the icing on the cake with his bullshit Got it. Yeah, he had people back in New York when I was there too. But whenever you have time, Chris, you know, hopefully you and your wife can fly in. It's a lot better in person. If not, hopefully we have time to do this again. You know, we love learning. And I promise well, we, you we, this we, will be everywhere. Yeah, we we'd love a Florida vacation if we can ever afford one. I'll so, fly no, I'll fly let, let, I'll fly I'll, I'll fly you in and actually post it. I'll spend the money to fly in, put you in a hotel, and then I'll actually use the material. Who the fuck flies somebody in and doesn't use it? Well, I, I forget. 
I, to I, me, it's I, just no. I, I thought you were saying if you ever pass through Palm Beach, that's all. Well, if you pass but, through, okay. But if you don't, I'll fly in. You know, well, that's a very kind offer. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Well, I can learn so a lot. I'll, from you. I'll talk to Jeannie about it. Maybe we'll do that someday. All okay, right, you Chris. guys, it's been wonderful. Thank All you right. so much for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you, Chris. To converse. You, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Okay? A lot of fun, man. Well, Honor to meet well, you. Thank you, Jeannie. Well, Appreciated everything. She's great with the okay. emails. He'd be lost without you, even with his 210 IQ. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him tell you any different. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, guys. All right, man. Have a great soon. night. Thank you for you, uh, you teaching me a lot. I appreciate it, man. Now I, okay. now, now I go back and read everything you wrote again. <laughs> no, I was just I was just basically talking casually. Think nothing of it, okay? Think nothing <laughs> of <Yeah>. this guy. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll be scheduling soon one way or another. Think nothing of okay. it. Okay, Chris. All right, Chris. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not right. one of the idiots right, that need my phone every sure, two seconds. Yeah, I'm sure Jeannie will be in touch with you. Okay, great. Uh, probably after this. So Yeah, I'll so send you we'll, all this we'll, stuff. We'll, we'll stay in touch. We'll stay committed. Absolutely. You stay strong and keep pumping, Chris. Thank and you, And get gentlemen. that shop done. I sure so will. Okay. And I won't say it to the universe and then go do something bad. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Have a great night, man. Okay, you guys too. Bye. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by Monster Energy. Tear into a can of the meanest energy drink on the planet, Monster Energy. It's the ideal combo of the right ingredients in the right proportion to deliver a big bad buzz that only Monster can. Monster packs a powerful punch, has a smooth, easy drinking flavor. Athletes, musicians, co-eds, road warriors, metalheads, geeks, hipsters, and bikers dig it. You will too. Monster Energy is more than just the green OG. Monster has Monster Ultra, Juice Monster, Monster Hydro, Rehab Monster, Dragon Tea, Monster Max, Muscle Monster, and many more. Buy on Amazon, buy on Walmart, or go to MonsterEnergy.com and believe me, you'll find a place. Unleash the beast. Monster Energy. This episode is sponsored by Aurora. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in America is? For years, this crime rate has been surging and affecting millions of Americans. I'm talking about identity theft, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. Yet despite this, those who have had their identity stolen are often shocked when it happens. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aurora, who is sponsoring this video. Aurora is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all into one easy-to-use app. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. Protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aurora for free for two weeks and see if you or anyone in your family's personal information has been compromised. Start your free trial today. Go to aurora.com slash MSCS. The link is in the description below.